नमस्कार डॉक्टर डिक्रोज बोल रहा हूँ हाँ सर नमस्कार मैम आप म्यूटेड हो ना सर हो गया ऑडिबल टू यू वेरी वेरी ऑडिबल वेरी ऑडिबल गुड इवनिंग सर वेलकम टू द दिल्ली वाई सर थैंक यू थैंक यू हम तो आधे दिल्ली वाले हैं हाँ सर आई नो यू बिलोंग टू दिल्ली वर्क प्लेस इज बॉम्बे सो यू बोथ बिलोंग यू बिलोंग टू बोथ द्लेसेज इम्पोर्टेंट प्लेसेज हाँ मैं मैंने मैंने लोगों को बताया दिल्ली में पैदा हुए थे कफन भी दिल्ली से ही जाएगी फाइनली यू आर वेलकम सर डोंट टॉक लाइक दैट यू आर स्टिल लॉन्ग टाइम टू गो बट आई लव द सिटी अनफॉर्चुनेटली वेन फॉर्चुनेटली अनफॉर्चुनेटली वेन आई फिनिश माई ट्रेनिंग डेली द ओनली बिगेस्ट हॉस्पिटल वॉज गंगाराम हॉस्पिटल और गंगाराम में भी ब्लड बैंक पार्लियामेंट स्ट्रीट से मंगाते थे ब्लड तब तो हम हम तो कुछ और और टाटा में पोस्ट मिल गई तो टाटा रुक गए मैं बोलता हूँ नसीब की बात है नहीं तो क्या जाने सौरभ की तरह मेरी भी बड़ी बंगलो होती कहीं दिल्ली में सफ्तर जंग में या ग्रेटर सौरभ गुड इवनिंग कैसे हो बढ़िया आप पूछने वाले क्या हो सर हमको तो अभी वायवा चाहे कुछ भी हो वायवा जैसा लग रहा है एग्जाम में जाते ना कैंडिडेट अरे मैंने बड़ा सिंपल देखो मैंने सौरभ को भी बोला मेरे क्वेश्चंस कब भी थियोरेटिकल नहीं होते मेरे क्वेश्चन सब प्रैक्टिकल होते हैं मैं स्टेजिंग पूछू मैं स्टेजिंग की स्लाइड दिखाता हूँ मैं ऐसे वाइवा कहाँ लेता हूँ मैं शर्मिंदा कर रहे हो आप <laughs> नहीं नहीं सर हम तो आपके मैं आई बिलीव एवरी प्रोग्राम यू लर्न विद दी डेलीगेट्स आई दिस इज माई बिलीफ कहीं ना कहीं किसी से एक पॉइंट जरूर मिलती है एटलीस्ट मुझे मिलती है मैं कुछ सीखता हूँ ऑलवेज हाँ सर गुड इवनिंग सर रवि सर हाँ आई कैन सी यू रवि आई वॉज गोइंग टू टॉक टू यू हाउ आर यू रवि आई एम फाइन सर I will uh, just request you, sir. Can you just shift here because uh, we can see your face, sir. Face there is a. अच्छा एक मिनट यार ये मे ये भगवान ने हमको ऐसी कलर दी है ठीक है मैं light white लगाता हूँ एक मिनट. Yes, sir. Please. थोड़ा सा सामने से light आए ना तो your face is not lighted, sir. हाँ. Sir, ठीक है. आप ठीक हैं? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very, very nice, sir. This is better, sir. This is better. Better. अच्छा वो वो मूनलाइट इफेक्ट नहीं आ रही सौरभ की तो दो दो लाइटें जल रही हैं सौरभ <laughs> सौरभ ऐसी तो लाइट में रहता है यू नो अच्छा लिसन आदि अदर डेलीगेट्स ऑन दिस और दिस इज अ फैकल्टी लिंक सर दिस इज फैकल्टी लिंक बट वी हैव सेंड दिस लिंक टू सिलेक्टेड फ्यू ऑफ द डेलीगेट्स एंड द मेंबर्स नहीं रेस्ट ऑफ द पीपल आर ऑन ऑनलाइन यूट्यूब ओके बिकॉज बिकॉज हम लोग थोड़ी सी बदमाशी बात कर रहे हैं ना पूरी इट शुड गो टू ऑल द मेंबर्स दैट्स व्हाई आई वी वी हैव नॉट स्टार्टेड द लाइव स्ट्रीमिंग ओके गुड रिले नहीं हुआ सर अभी अभी गुड सो बेसिकली ईश्वर आई हैव केप्ट आई कैन सी डीके आल्सो ही इज पार्ट ऑफ द पैनल आई हैव आई हैव केप्ट वेरी सिंपल क्वेश्चंस revolving around the six uh, subheadings that i sent and i took some tips from saurav more or less because he exchanged to with me some thoughts of his more or less i had those thoughts only in mind we'll start with some basics on work up and need for biopsy or removing with case illustration uh, or uh, at least mere practice mein at least 20 30 40 pe samiti aa gaye hmm आई सडनली थॉट ये स्क्रीन में उजाला कैसा आ गया और फिर समित की फोटो आ गई बीच में आफ्टरनून शमित यूर स्निफलिंग एंड ऑल आई एम स्टिल इन माई ऑफिस बिकॉज बाय इकोनॉमी कनेक्शन एंड होम इज नॉट गुड इनफ फॉर योर ब्राइटनेस ना Yeah, yeah, but uh, who who's your who's your subscriber at home? What, what do you all use? So there's a con- place thing called Connect Broadband. It's uh, I hope we are not on webinar time. I just I hope it's no, safe. it's not yet. It's not yet. But you know what I want to tell you? I've got myself a little Geo dongle of Mukesh Ambani's. I find it pretty decent. Yeah. Of course, we have the Tata Broadband as well. 
uh, but I just got this little dongle. I travel with it even in hotels now. I don't need to ask them for password and all. I just fire up my dongle and I use my internet. I'm kidding. I just happened to be in the hospital, so so I decided to do it over here only. And it's great to see you after a long time. Great Likewise, to see you after Likewise. Likewise. Doctor Ravi, Doctor Sarab, everyone. Like, uh, hi. So, Doctor Ravi, can we will start at six five? Uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, can we, we can start at six five. Yeah. So sure, sounds good. Whatever, whatever you want. Whatever. Uh, yes. Just, uh, just we are uh, online now. You we are okay. online. Uh, uh, Ravi, Ishwar, and Sora. One quick question: When we are doing the panel, if there are questions from the delegates, who will assimilate I, them and I, give I, it back? Ravi, who? Ravi will do, sir. Doctor, okay, Doctor Sora. Ravi. Okay. No, no, Doctor Ravi, you do it because I will be. In the okay, I will do it. I will do it. I will yeah. Do it. So either you can interrupt and ask the questions, or you can WhatsApp it to me. I'm keeping my phone right next to me. I can take it. Otherwise, you can also say there are two questions from panelists, and right, then you right. can. Ask them. Right, right, sure. Because okay. there will be many questions on the YouTube. Um, yeah. Please, so. Okay, right. great. So, uh, sir. So, uh, I think, sir, we are uh, live now. Uh, I okay. will request Dr. Ishwar Singh to start the proceedings, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. I welcome you as a president of Delhi OI for this uh, second webinar on uh, tumors of nose and paranasal sinuses. Last was on mucor mycosis. It was a lengthy webinar for three hours. We discuss about this black fungus, which is a hot topic. And today's topic, we have tumors of nose and paranasal sinuses. We can't hold a physical meeting because of this COVID scenario, which is going on in Delhi. So we thought of holding this meeting on, on webinar. And I welcome you once more for this. And we have eminent panelists and a internationally renowned moderator for today's function. So I hand over the mic to Dr. Ravi Meher. Uh, my very dynamic, active secretary. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so I welcome you all uh, for this online webinar on nose and paranasal sinus uh, malignancies. Uh, before we start, I have some bad news to share. Uh, uh, a, a very senior uh, ENT colleague of ours and, and a member of Delhi OI, Dr. Gurdeep Singh, uh, expired two days back and uh, uh, after a long battle with the COVID. And uh, I would just like to uh, extend my heartfelt uh, uh, condolences to the family. Uh, Dr. Gurdeep was also uh, ex-president of Delhi OI and he was alumni of Ames Delhi. And um, he was also uh, president of Delhi OI and uh, uh, Dr. Sora was uh, at that time secretary of Delhi OI. Uh, also, uh, there, are, there is another um, bad news about two young ENT surgeons, uh, Dr. Vivek Oberai and Dr. Uh, Prerna Jain. Uh, though, uh, they were practicing in, in Delhi as an ENT surgeon. Uh, we lost them uh, due to COVID in last two weeks. So my heartfelt uh, condolences to the entire family and uh, I pray to God for their, uh, uh, their souls to rest in peace. Uh, now I ex, uh, hand over the stage to Dr. Saurabh. Uh, Dr. Saurabh is, uh, uh, is past secretary of Delhi OI, as I have already told you. Uh, he is a dynamic uh, head and neck oncosurgeon practicing at uh, Max Veshali in Delhi. And uh, he will be coordinating the sessions today. And we have very uh, interesting talks lined up. And we also have a panel discussion in the end, which will be uh, uh, moderated by Dr. Anil D. Cruz and um, uh, thanking you uh, all and I hand over the uh, stage to Dr. Saurabh. Thank you Dr. Ravi and thank you Delhi OI uh, for giving me opportunity to conduct this session and uh, I welcome you all. Today we are discussing the PNS uh, malignancies and we have chosen this topic because uh, it is a little rare when we compare to the other subsites and uh, they are very uh, lesser talks are there and also the literature is not that fast uh, available for this topic. Also, there are many ENT residents there in, uh, today in for today webinar who are attending the webinar 
and uh, uh, they have a lot of questions for the pns malignancy during uh, their uh, examination also because of the complex anatomy and the diverse pathology and important structure around these uh, uh, sinuses uh, it is very uh, uh, difficult to operate area and uh, to take also the take decisions uh, which structure has to preserve when so uh, but with the eminent faculty with the vast experience today uh, we will be definitely uh, more wiser after this uh, webinar so first of all i will uh, the, there will be three talks first uh, the 15 minutes each 15 to 20 minutes and then there will be a panel discussion for uh, one, one one hour 15 minutes So the first talk I will invite Dr. Smriti Panda. She is uh, uh, from Ames, Delhi, and uh, uh, she is young, a dynamic head and neck surgeon, and a very energetic person. So you will see the energy in her uh, presentation today. So I welcome uh, uh, Dr. Smriti. Dr. Smriti uh, uh, will talk about uh, when to do the endoscopic or uh, uh, open approaches in the uh, parietal sinus tumor surgery. How to decide uh, depending on radiological and pathological finding? Doctor Smithy, please. Um, thank you, sir. I'll be sharing my screen. I hope my screen is visible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, my talk is on integrating preoperative radiology and pathology in decision making on endoscopic versus open approaches for sinonasal neoplasms. Just a minute. Sorry. An optimal preoperative radiological assessment is imperative before deciding on the appropriate surgical approach. Clinicians generally agree that a tumor is best evaluated uh, using both the uh, radiological modalities, that is a CT or an MRI. A preoperative scan not only allows one to map the disease extent and the relationship with critical neurovascular structure, but it also provides information related to the nature of the disease as well as its vascularity. Uh, the uh, gold standard surgical approach for a tumor located in the uh, paranasal sinus and the ventral skull base was the conventional transfacial approach. We are gradually moving towards uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. And with the advancement in endoscopic technology and uh, availability of various powered instruments and a variety of angled instruments to choose from, the anatomical limits of uh, endoscopic approach is uh, uh, rapidly expanding day by day. And we can also combine the two modalities uh, for very extensive PNS tumors that involve the intracranial cavity or with a large component in the intratemporal fossa. So this slide basically shows the uh, conventional uh, surgical approaches, which are uh, well known to all of us, ranging from anterior approach, mainly the transmaxillary, transethmoidal, and the transpalatal approach. We also have the preauricular subtemporal approach, which provides a lateral trajectory to tumors. Uh, which extend uh, lateral to the paraclival internal carotid artery. Finally, we have the craniofacial resection for uh, tumors with intracranial extension. Uh, coming to endoscopic endonasal approaches, these approaches are mainly divided uh, into a sagittal plane and a coronal plane. In the sagittal module, uh, the entire uh, ventral skull base can be exposed right from the frontal sinus to the uh, second cervical vertebra. And we have the transfrontal approach, transcribriform approach, the transplanum, uh, transpenoidal, and the transclival approaches. In the coronal plane, uh, the anterior most approach we have is the uh, transorbital approach, where a corridor is created between the medial and the inferior rectus muscle. Uh, moving on laterally, uh, in the middle uh, group of approaches, which provide uh, access to the middle part of the uh, ventral skull base, uh, of importance to paranasal sinus uh, tumors, we have the transterygoid approach. So coming to the absolute indications for uh, an open approach, whenever we have uh, extensive skin involvement as seen in these pictures, which require excision of the overlying skin, uh, uh, these kind of tumors are best suited for uh, open transfacial approaches. 
And also when there is extensive uh, erosion of the bone as seen here, the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus is eroded or there is involvement of the palate and uh, uh, erosion of the posterolateral wall of the maxilla as well as the zygoma. Any form of bony erosion of the maxilla except erosion of the medial wall of the maxilla requires some form of maxillectomy by open technique. Uh, now coming to the uh, orbital uh, involvement, decision making between uh, open approach and endoscopic approach is pretty straightforward when you have a patient who has no perception of light with a fixed globe or there is uh, extensive involvement of the eyelid skin and the uh, conjunctiva. So in these cases, uh, patient qualifies for uh, orbital eccentration and it is best done using uh, open approaches. For uh, lesser degrees of orbital involvement, it can range radiologically uh, by, uh, as seen in the first picture where there is just erosion of the lamina papracia and the periorbita is intact. These kind of cases are well suited for an endoscopic approach provided other selection criteria have been fulfilled. Uh, in the second uh, scenario, there is focal involvement of the periorbita as seen by these white arrows. These cases are also suitable for uh, endoscopic approach provided we have got intraoperative assistance by frozen section where we can ascertain that the underlying fat is uh, uh, free on frozen section. In the third case, there is intraconal involvement of the orbit. And these cases, it is a difficult task to pre preserve the orbital function. And therefore these cases are again uh, uh, suitably managed by open uh, conventional approaches. And lastly, we have uh, orbital apex involvement. In these cases, it is difficult to obtain a R0 resection even after sacrificing the orbit. And some cases can also be considered for non-surgical modalities. Infiltration of the infratemporal fossa, per se, it's not a contraindication for an endoscopic approach. Uh, as uh, we know in case of juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma with certain degrees of infratemporal fossa involvement, they can still be excised endoscopically in the hands of an expert. However, as seen in uh, this case, it is a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the maxilla extensively infiltrating the infratemporal fossa and also obliterating the parapharyngeal space fat. So these kind of cases are best suited uh, for transfacial uh, open approaches. Uh, coming to cavernous sinus involvement, the best radiology to assess the cavernous sinus is T1 post contrast MRI sequences. Uh, here we can see extensive involvement of the uh, cavernous sinus in case of a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. This is again best managed by conventional techniques. Uh, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma with minimal involvement of the cavernous sinus can still be managed by endoscopically. However, in this case where there is bilateral encasement of the ICA, this again requires either an open approach or at least a combined approach. Uh, Apart from direct infiltration as seen in these two cases, there can be uh, uh, involvement of the cavernous sinus by means of perineural invasion as seen in adenoid cystic carcinoma. Uh, since adenoid cystic carcinoma is a slow growing tumor, so these cases can also be managed uh, either by open technique as well as by uh, endoscopic, uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, coming to evaluation of uh, intracranial involvement, uh, if one is able to uh, identify a clear-cut plane with the dura, these cases can be managed by uh, an, uh, endoscopic uh, craniosacral resection. However, in this patient, we can see that the dura, there is uh, involvement of the dura in one uh, focal area. Uh, in cases where there is uh, no clear-cut demarcation with the dura, it is an intracranial intradural disease and it is best managed by craniofacial resection. In the presence of extensive brain parenchymal involvement with perilational edema, one can seek assistance from the uh, neurosurgery colleagues. And these kind of cases, again, one should keep uh, non-surgical modalities uh, into consideration. So why should uh, one decide uh, about the uh, 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 selection criteria for endoscopic endonasal approach? The key principle for selecting an endoscopic endonasal approach is that in uh, carefully selected cases, it provides the most direct approach to a tumor with minimal, uh, 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 with, uh, which does not require a brain retraction, avoids craniotomy, avoids facial inc uh, incisions, and requires minimal manipulation of critical neurovascular structures. And also there is uh, 
hardly any disassembly of uh, craniofacial uh, skeleton, which is very important in the pediatric age group, as there is potential risk for uh, uh, involvement of the uh, growth centers if such a surgery ablative procedure is performed in the pediatric age group. Uh, now coming to the uh, radiological criteria for selecting an endoscopic endonasal approach, uh, one needs to review the preoperative radiology carefully. And uh, it is important to know that these approaches are very much suitable for a uh, tumor located in the central uh, skull base, basically a midline tumor, which is medial to the uh, uh, mid pupillary line. So these cases can be uh, managed endoscopically using the uh, uh, transfrontal or the transcribriform approach where an endoscopic graft 3 can be performed. In the presence of infratemporal fossa involvement, if the component of infratemporal fossa involvement is located lateral to the uh, inferior uh, orbital nerve complex, then a white androstomy or a white antral window and a, a medial maxillectomy can provide uh, adequate uh, endoscopic exposure. This is an olfactory group meningioma, again a very suitable uh, candidate for an expanded endonasal approach. As previously mentioned, it is a midline tumor situated medial to the optic nerve and also ventral to the anterior communicating artery. So the uh, transcriptiform approach in these cases uh, can uh, provide margin negative resection and while at the same time avoiding a craniotomy. So these are some of the cases which are not uh, considered to be suitable for an endoscopic approach and are better managed by open techniques. Here we can see lateral extension of the tumor beyond the mid pupillary line involving the lateral recess of the frontal sinus. And in the uh, uh, last two figures, you can see there is involvement, uh, uh, there is uh, tumor extension superiorly and laterally uh, in relation to the optic nerve. So these tumors again are better managed by open technique. Apart from tumor extent, the operating surgeon should also be aware of certain anatomical variants which can make the endoscopic approach uh, difficult. For example, uh, a, a deviated nasal septum or a sharp spur needs to be recognized and corrected. One needs to uh, uh, identify presence of a ONOD cell or abnormal septation of the sphenoid sinus. Here we can see a dehiscent carotid artery and also under pneumatized sphenoid sinus like we have the uh, pre-cellar variant of sphenoid sinus here and aberrant course of the internal carotid artery. Now moving on to the histology based uh, decision making for uh, commonly uh, encountered histological variants, starting with the benign tumors. The first is inverted papilloma. Uh, though it is a benign uh, tumor, but uh, one needs to uh, have a very radical approach in terms of resection because of uh, various factors, for, exa uh, for example, multicentricity, and uh, it is associated with uh, synchronous malignancy, and uh, there is also a propensity for recurrence. So before proceeding uh, uh, towards decision making whether one needs to go in for an endoscopic or an open approach, the preoperative CT needs to be evaluated to look for the site of attachment, which is seen in many cases as, as a uh, ostitic area. The common uh, norm, whether one is uh, uh, using an open technique or an endoscopic technique for inverted papilloma is to do a subperiosteal dissection and to include the point of attachment and to drill the underlying bone. The conventional open techniques for uh, inverted papilloma uh, include uh, lateral rhinotomy, medial maxillectomy, and the Denker procedure. Uh, however, the, uh, if one is having the expertise to perform a expanded endonasal procedure, one can uh, uh, altogether do away with the uh, facial incision. So if, that is, if the disease is located in the middle meatus, a type 1 endoscopic resection can be performed, which includes a complete ethmoidectomy, sphenoidotomy, and a large middle meatal antrostomy. If the disease extends beyond the middle meatus into the maxillary antrum, then an endoscopic medial maxillectomy needs to be performed with or without resection of the nasolacrimal duct. Type 3 resection, which is an endoscopic denker, uh, it, can, it uh, is indicated for tumors which are located along the postrolateral wall, inferior wall, or the anterior wall. There are some relative contraindications, and uh, these include disease involving the frontal sinus. Again, uh, ex uh, if there is enough surgical expertise, 
such tumor can be handled with the help of 45 degree or 70 degree endoscope and angled instruments one also needs to be careful uh, in revision cases where there can be scarring or new osteogenesis of the frontal recess and in cases where there is associated malignancy coming to the next commonly encountered tumor which is the frontoethmoidal osteoma uh, a frontoethmoidal osteoma can be easily excised endoscopically if the attachment is medial to the lamina papyracea and if it is attached to the inferior part of the posterior wall of the frontal sinus and the minimum ap diameter of the frontal sinus is 10 mm to allow movement of the in, uh, instruments the absolute contraindications for an endoscopic approach is when there is erosion of the posterior wall of the frontal sinus or erosion of the anterior wall when the ap diameter is less than 10 mm and as previously mentioned there is new osteogenesis at the frontal recess and in case of attachment to the lateral or the suprolateral wall so these kind of uh, osteomas are labeled as far lateral osteoma where you can see that the attachment site is located lateral to the lamina line drawn parallel to the lamina papyracea uh, as uh, seen in this uh, uh, publication quoted a uh, majority of these tumors uh, required some form of open approach for their resection uh, coming to juvenile esophageal angiofibroma uh, the initial reports and experience of endoscopic resection of juvenile angiofibroma were restricted to ratkowski stage 1 and 2 but now we have many centers where uh, endoscopic excision of uh, jna is being performed even up to uh, stage 3 as uh, seen in this multicentric study published uh, in the archives of uh, otolaryngology uh, they had collected data from six different academic centers and uh, endoscopic excision of jna could be performed for ratkowski stage uh, 1 2 3 and uh, all all the patients had undergone pre operative embolization and disease could be easily removed from the sphenoid sinus pterygopalatine fossa and infratemporal fossa some difficult to access zones according to the authors uh, was the uh, uh, pterygoid recess of the sphenoid sinus and uh, 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 lateral extension of the infratemporal fossa as we can see with the help of a 30 degree endoscope a wide view of the infratemporal fossa can be obtained other difficult to access areas were tumors located uh, uh, near the clivus the foramen nasirum the root of the pterygoid and the interpterygoid fossa and when there is extensive infiltration of the infratemporal fossa towards the cheek with the interdigitating growth pattern so the authors recommend combining endoscopy with open approach in these cases Uh, we also have various adjunctive tools to decrease the intraoperative blood loss uh, while uh, uh, performing a endoscopic uh, resection of jna uh, one can use either a ktp laser or a plasma ablation with the help of coagulator uh, even with uh, all the uh, latest uh, uh, technologies available endoscopic excision of large jna is still considered to be challenging some of the uh, maneuvers which can increase the feasibility in these cases is creation of a large anteral window excising the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus performing a posterior septectomy can allow a two surgeon technique and early division of the main vascular pedicles sometimes we can have uh, the tumor supplied by multiple uh, vascular territories so each vascular territory needs to be managed sequentially if there are large feeders from vessels which were not amenable to pre operative embolization or there are feeders from the internal carotid artery those cases can uh, be uh, excised in a staged manner now coming to endoscopic uh, resection of paranasal sinus malignancy the first is squamous cell carcinoma the uh, initial uh, apprehension and criticism for endonasal endoscopic management of uh, sinonasal malignant tumor was that on block resection is not feasible in these cases however uh, the currently available literature has established the fact that it is margin negative resection and not uh, piecemeal or end block resection which decides the prognosis of a, a patient but one needs to be careful when using endoscopic uh, endonasal approach for squamous cell carcinoma as it is a aggressive histology and therefore stricter uh, selection criteria needs to be in place Uh, nakamaru et al uh, has uh, suggested a attachment oriented surgery as an alternative to piecemeal excision 
Here, the main bulk of the tumor is debrided with the help of a micro debrider to identify the point of attachment. This is followed by uh, taking frozen sections from uh, the surrounding mucosa. And once margin negativity has been confirmed pathologically, uh, the margins are uh, tailored and uh, subperiosteal dissection is performed. If the underlying bone is found to be eroded, the underlying bone is also uh, excised along with the specimen. A similar uh, a surgical technique has also been proposed by Castelnovo. Uh, he has, in addition, advocated excision of the uh, dura, olfactory bulb, and periorbita in case these were found to be involved preoperatively. These are some of the uh, uh, retrospective data which is available uh, where uh, sinonasal squamous cell carcinoma was managed by expanded endonasal technique. As we can see, there is a preponderance of T1 and T2 tumors. The current guidelines for uh, using endoscopic endonasal technique for uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, is T1 and T2 tumors of the nasoethmoidal complex and selected T3 with no underlying bone erosion. Uh, cases with skull base erosion, dural involvement, brain involvement, or uh, cases medial to the mid-orbital group should only be considered in cases where there is less aggressive sinonasal pathology. The uh, next important tumor is olfactory neuroblastoma. Uh, surgical principle for resection of olfactory neuroblastoma usually uh, should include the cribriform plate, the crista galli, and the olfactory bulb and the informed dura. This can either be performed by conventional craniofacial technique or by endoscopic means. Uh, in, uh, excision of the olfactory bulb can be avoided in case of early tumors like the uh, Kaddish A or uh, the T1 tumor uh, if, if a clear-cut line of demarcation can be identified on preoperative radiology. Uh, currently, we have got multiple uh, reports, retrospective single institution studies in the literature where uh, endoscopic techniques have been compared with open approach for olfactory neuroblastoma. And one such meta-analysis has been recently published and has shown that the endoscopic uh, technique has got better results than the open surgery. This probably, uh, probably reflects underlying selection bias and also because uh, the follow-up period of the endoscopic surgery cohort was less than the open surgery cohort. As previously mentioned, conventional uh, uh, teaching is to excise the olfactory bulb on both sides, but this leads to loss of olfaction. So uh, uh, there are presently uh, studies which are coming up for unilateral uh, resection of uh, olfactory neuroblastoma in well-lateralized tumor. This is based on the premise that the perpendicular plate of ethmoid and the crista galli act as anatomical barrier. And next we have the adenoid cystic carcinoma. It is a slow growing tumor with propensity for multiple recurrences and uh, perineural invasion and distant metastasis. The surgical principles are similar to what has already been discussed. Uh, if there is extension into the mesopharynx, one uh, needs to additionally resect the cart uh, cartilaginous eustachian tube and the vidian nerve complex. And due to high incidence of perineural invasion, uh, adjuvant radiotherapy is often the norm, uh, especially if high-grade uh, histology and positive margins have been documented in post-operative histology. And lastly, we have got the clival chordoma. It is a, a, a low grade. It can be considered as a low-grade malignancy because it has got locally. Uh, uh, it, it is locally aggressive. And uh, it is one of the tumors where the first line surgical management is an endoscopic endonasal uh, approach because it has a, a very favorable midline location and it has a tendency to displace the neuroaxis dorsally. Therefore, it provides us with a very favorable tumor vascular and tumor uh, cranial nerve uh, interface. The only indication for open approach in case of a clival chordoma is when one requires to stabilize the uh, cranial uh, cervical junction or there is paracellar extension. The preoperative radiology also needs to be evaluated carefully in this uh, case to uh, measure the cl uh, clival incline or the basal angle. Uh, this is calculated by drawing a line between the anterior and posterior clinoid process and another line uh, parallel to the uh, clivus. 
If the angle is obtuse, then it has been seen that the reach of the hadad flap for skull base uh, reconstruction uh, becomes limited. The other angle which is of importance is the tuberculum angle. Uh, here, instead of drawing a line uh, parallel to the clivus, the line is drawn parallel to the cella. So, a uh, obtuse angle in these cases gives a more favorable endoscopic uh, exposure. As mentioned uh, previously, paracellar extension is one of the criteria to uh, employ an open technique for uh, chordoma excision. So, when tumor is extending postrolateral to the ICA or involving the Meckel's cave, extending lateral to the carotid canal or the jugular bulb, or extending uh, up to the occipital condyle, the expanded endonasal technique can be combined with one, with one of the uh, open lateral approaches. Another important limit for uh, expanded endonasal approach for uh, clival chordoma is the uh, nasopalatine line, which was described by Kassam. This is uh, obtained by drawing a line connecting the heart, uh, heart palate with the nasal bone. And when this line is extrapolated posteriorly, it intersects with the uh, C2 vertebra. So any tumor which is located below the line is not amenable for expanded endonasal technique. And we also have the nasopalatine angle where the, uh, another line is drawn uh, parallel to the heart palate and intersects the previous line. This angle gives the uh, nasal corridor available for, uh, 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 for uh, excising tumors arising from the uh, skull base. So finally, to conclude, there are several points which need to be taken into consideration on deciding the appropriate approach for sinonasal skull base tumor starting with the anatomical location, the degree of tumor extension, relationship with critical neurovascular structure, tumor consistency, prior surgical approach, and most importantly, the surgeon's preference and expertise. And consideration should also be uh, taken to choose an approach which provides the most direct route to the tumor, but also optimizes exposure and vis visualization of the tumor interface with critical structures. Thank you. Dr. Smithy, this is a wonderful uh, presentation with the anatomical uh, background and also the indication perfectly you have uh, told that uh, what are the indications for endoscopic approach. I think we can take question in the later part uh, when there will be a panel. So I will uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Shamit Chopra. Dr. Shamit Chopra uh, is a head and neck surgeon. He practices in Jalanda and uh, uh, he's uh, trained from Molana Jhar and then uh, from uh, uh, University of Michigan. And he will talk about uh, the optimizing oncologic and functional outcome in the surgery for paranasal neuroplasm. Uh, uh, Dr. Shamit, please. Thank you, Saurabh. I hope I'm audible as well as the slide is visible. Yeah. Great. So greetings to all and uh, especially to Derry AOI. This is a great platform for, for us to be able to share our limited experience about these relatively rare tumors and also hopefully learn from each other as we go on uh, and, uh, and, and try to treat these to the best of our ability. When Professor Ishwar had uh, talked to me about planning a session of this nature, it was inevitable that, that AOI Delhi already has so much brain power at their disposal and so much experience. It's always great to contribute to Delhi. I consider myself a second citizen and I believe our August faculty, Dr. De Cruz, who's the only other one from outside of Delhi, he also considers the same. Uh, so I hope that, uh, that this will be beneficial to everyone as we plan. Uh, the brief of the Secretary Delhi AOI about being sufficiently basic is well taken. Uh, we will try to focus on only on the basic aspects and hopefully through Dr. Saurabh's uh, moderation, we'll be able to get the answers to the questions that arise at the end of the talk. And I also hope that along with my co-speakers in the talks, uh, we will be able to provide a great setup for the panel discussion, which will be moderated by none other than Dr. De Cruz. And hopefully, just like he can, encapsulate the perspectives to best take uh, this matter forward. So without further ado, uh, the, the subject given to me is to uh, optimize oncological and functional outcomes in sinonasal neoplasms. For the most part, we'll be talking about surgery per se, but we will have a couple of slides and hopefully Karan can add a little bit more to that as well. <clears throat> Before we start talking about outcomes, it's important to realize that there are barriers to evaluation of outcomes in this tumor. <clears throat> These tumors are rare, as you can see. Prospective trials are lacking inherently. So decision-making is largely based on 
non-histology specific retrospective studies. And probably of all the subsites of the head and neck, BNS is the one in which the changes and advancements in radiation and imaging, preoperative evaluation, as uh, Smriti just pointed out, have affected decision making over the last couple of decades. So we'll try to encapsulate all that as we move forward. There are widely varying histologies and there's a huge institutional bias because different institutes still prefer to treat this rare subset of tumors in the lack of high quality evidence differently. Uh, however, there are some large series which we can fall back on. Uh, there is uh, the SEER database. Again, the, the global SEER is the SEER. Uh, we know based on this, this is still 2009, uh, incidence is gradually declining of these tumors. Survival is largely unchanged. So contrary to other uh, sites of the head and neck barring the larynx, where survival has improved, it is concerning that despite the advancements that we're going to talk about and which will be covered subsequently as well, we've not really managed to make a significant dent in the survival. Of course, yeah, this yeah. Will, have the, will have the classic limitations of any SEER database, but again, a point worth considering. The incidence of advanced cases has decreased, and that's probably because of early presentation, more cancer centers getting set up. This, of course, is North American, so, so there is some geographic disparity to this as well. And there are racial disparities. Another document, again, I, I liked uh, the moderator's comment on an email group of ours that this has to be focused on the students and the postgraduates. So barring the SEER database, this is another recommended reading that I would, uh, I would really ask you to, to, to go over. And uh, it would be uh, the ACR appropriateness criteria. ACR is the American College of Radiology. Uh, they focus on uh, the appropriate utilization of radiological information to help make the right decision. Uh, like Smriti pointed out in endoscopic and hopefully we'll trade a little bit as we go along. So what will we talk about over the course of the next 15 minutes is a couple of slides about evaluation and surgical management of the primary lesion. How do we select the approach? Actually, we will just glean over it because she's already covered that. Essentially, the difference once surgical management has been decided is going to be between endoscopic and open. When do we manage the neck? Uh, surgically or electively? And when do we give radiation and systemic therapy? Is there any way that we can reduce the toxicity of either of the non-surgical modalities? And last but not the least, a, a subject which, uh, which I was asked to focus on is reconstruction. And, and in maxilla or in the PNS, we have elegant classifications that can help us guide us and actually do class-specific reconstruction. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Taking the basic matters forward, uh, it's important to realize at the outset that surgery remains standard of care for resectable nasal and paranasal sinus neoplasms. Of course, with, uh, with some uh, differences uh, in terms of lymphomas, and of course, again, surgery is not standard of care, but when we talk about carcinomas in general, we will talk about surgery being the preferred modality or preferred initial modality of choice. And among the most important prognostic determinants in definitively treated sinusal cancer is the T-stage. How do we get to that T-stage? We've talked a little bit more about it, but conventionally, a combination of CT and MR are utilized whenever you are thinking of resecting these. Uh, that is a generalization. There will be certain exceptions where you can manage with one modality, especially for T1 and T2 disease. But for the most part, for T3 and higher sinonasal cancers, when you're planning surgery, you will utilize a combination of the information given to you by CT as well as MR. And if you don't assess the local disease extent properly, remember this is an area which uh, has modest outcomes because of perineural extension, proximity to vital structures, uh, vital organs being affected. So it's extremely important that when definitive therapy is selected, it truly should be definitive. Talking about CT and MR, uh, this is an interesting study, relatively recent, in which uh, the positive predictive value for imaging was compared between CT and MR. Uh, sensitivity was modest, as you, as you would expect in these cases, and those are the sites that they focused on. Uh, the uh, boundaries beyond which you don't consider reconstruction. For instance, if there is disease beyond the dura, frontal sphenoid sinuses, even though there are certain histologic, uh, certain histologies where you would consider a section, but for the most part, that is when you start thinking whether or not you have to select non-surgical organ preservation or maybe downstage the tumor using induction tumor. And remember, the last point is probably the most important take home in this slide. There is CT and MR mapping, however accurate it is, it cannot replace uh, the importance of the surgeon experience. So you have to make sure that you, you sample the areas, not only do you map the tumor radiologically, very often you will map the tumor by sending frozen sections at the time of the surgery as well. Uh, of course, open craniofacial resections were what started the whole thing off in surgery for sinonasal cancers. Uh, this study has been quoted very, very often indeed. And uh, we, we know that the international collaborative study 
uh, really highlighted the three points which are listed at the end. Positive margin, histology, and intracranial extension are something which are predictors of poor overall survival, disease-specific survival, and relapse-free survival or multivariate analysis. What's important also are the things that are listed at the top. Uh, this plethora of surgeons with uh, a great deal or a relatively good deal of uh, skull-based surgery experience still had significant mortality, significant post-operative complications, and still had modest survival. This, of course, opened the door to what Spriti just talked about, the endoscopic endonasal and the cranioendoscopic approaches. Uh, again, not going into specific studies per se. Uh, these are things in which uh, I'd be happy to mail the presentation, the PDF, in case someone wants it. But, uh, but yes, there have been multiple studies which have highlighted, especially in select histologies and select these stages, uh, given the fact that you have a good experience, you would be able to extrapolate endoscopic expertise to the management of these malignant tumors as well. And of course, this is a disclaimer. Most of my talk will talk about malignancies in general. Uh, again, it boils down to a question of stage histology and expertise, like we talked about. The endoscopic approach has to be mastered by someone who's already a good open surgeon so that you can, you can trade off the approach in case you need to, depending upon tumor extent, and also take the matter forward with regard to making sure, I think she mentioned a margin negative resection, which is extremely important. Adjuvant therapy in sinolasal cancers, it's important, again, the points highlighted in red, uh, that in T3 and T4 squamous cell cancers and poorly differentiated carcinoma of the maxillary sinus, we do have evidence that elective neck radiation, uh, in the absence of demonstrable nodal metastasis, can improve the outcome parameters. And remember, we are only talking of algae right now, reconstructive is, is yet to be discussed. We know that IMRT, uh, based on a couple of studies, again, someone could argue uh, in favor or against, but it is potentially associated with lower toxicity, especially when we're talking about vital areas. And indications for post-operative radiation, that would be our take home for this slide. Positive or close surgical margins, we already talked about that. The grade of tumor directly influences that. Perineural invasion, as is the case in most other squamous cell cancers, or concern regarding surgical margins, but that's a subjective element of concern by the surgeon per se. We talked about, uh, uh, about getting negative margins, but in a box like the maxilla, and in a structure that's uh, uh, not as well defined as other organs of the head and neck in terms of getting margins, a lot of these will be piecemeal or so-called section. Uh, what is the importance of negative margin? This study is interesting. It's, it's from the last decade, but it talks about uh, whenever you had a complete resection with negative margins, again, the caveat is non-state non specific. The BFS and the OS was significantly higher when you did a partial resection with positive margins. And the uh, row at the bottom would tell you that whenever the patient was given non-surgical organ preservation alone, at that time, you are looking at the relatively low DFS and OS because these tumors were typically considered candidates for non-surgical organ preservation in lieu of borderline resectability. When do we elect, uh, electively address the neck? And we talked about that already. Uh, it's not the same rules that we follow for more common tumors like oral cancer. Uh, we talked about T3, T4 and polydifferentiated carcinoma of the maxilla. Uh, but what's important, again, is the fact that uh, whenever the tumor extends beyond the sinus confines, whenever the well-defined bony boundaries, especially anteriorly or anterior inferiorly, start getting breached, and whenever you get alveolus, GBS, and palate involvement, you do tend to get more level 1B and 2 and to a lesser extent level 1A involvement. In that case, you do want to address the neck. Uh, this, again, I'll just uh, briefly go through. I think Deepak was initially supposed to cover it. I think Karan will be doing a great job in his, uh, in his um, unavoidable absence. But we talked about uh, uh, radiation therapy very briefly. There is a role for the following, intra-arterial chemotherapy, induction chemotherapy. It's not part of standard care. Uh, as far as postgraduates go, I think the bottom line would be uh, considering surgery the standard of care. But what to do about unresectable tumors is important. And again, the study at the bottom, at the time that we did a comparable study, this was in 2009, uh, this series from MSKCC on unresectable tumors showed that cisplatin-based regimens were associated with better survival outcomes. In Michigan, we tried to look at our own data. We looked at a subset of 25-odd uh, uh, unresectable tumors uh, of uh, the nasoethmoidal and the maxillary subsets. And, sure. we, and we realized that, uh, that, again, outcomes were modest compared to the biopsy-only row in the, the slide in two slides prior, the study that we've mentioned about surgical margins. But, uh, but in this case, again, we realized that you can cure a significant minority or at least symptom control a significant minority. So don't throw that option out the window. Just don't send an unresectable patient 
or a borderline receptible patient, uh, don't consign him to best supportive care. If the patient is good PS, then you might be able to prolong their survival. And that's roughly about half the patients. Coming to reconstruction per se, we talked about optimizing oncologic outcomes very briefly, but we'll talk a little bit about reconstruction. What's important again to know is that uh, whenever we, we talk about uh, uh, reconstruction, on the, on the left, you see a panoramic picture of the skull base, parapharyngeal and upward, incorporating cyanonasal. Uh, but the ones on the left, you're seeing when you need to reconstruct the PNS and skull base. And that may not necessarily be with a flap. It might just be with a layered graft technique, as is very often used in endoscopic resections. Dural defects, large bony defects between the skull base, communication of the cyanonasal and the nasopharynx area with IC space, but largely skull base reconstruction would typically be covered under those subsets. When we talk about uh, reconstruction, which uh, typically should restore form as well as function. So yes, not just preventing uh, the, the CSF leak or not just to restore the CSF barrier, but also to provide some form to the mid face, especially. It's extremely important that we uh, don't under acknowledge the role of free flaps currently. As we start getting higher, and as more conventional flaps like the forehead, the superior flaps like the forehead, paramedian forehead, they still have a role, of course. But when you talk about uh, uh, more distal axial flaps like the pectoralis major, they have a very limited role in this. So either you go with superior flaps like the uh, paramedian forehead, the lateral forehead based on the STA or the temporalis, which we'll talk about very briefly. But yes, it's also important to acknowledge the role of free flaps. And these are the reasons why we do that. Uh, the success rate, of course, remains higher compared to most other particle series. We just did an audit on more than 500 free flaps in oral cancer at our institution, and we're looking at more than 95%, as would most institutions that do an equal or a higher number of cases. I alluded earlier to how we can standardize the reconstructive plan. In this case, the PNS is not the poor cousin. We do have elegant classifications. The, the two that are encouraged, the young oncologic surgeons, are uh, to read are James Brown and Arkin and Okai. This uh, image is from the James Brown classification. There are classes and each one of them, especially class one, is divided into one uh, A, B, C, and D. So how do we tackle them? We'll give you case vignettes as we go along in the remaining three or four minutes of this presentation. An isolated palate defect is class one A, as most of you would consider an obturation to be significant. But then you see this girl, she's 25 years old, has a polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma, will not be requiring adjuvant therapy, uh, in this case, the ideal reconstruction would, uh, the ideal uh, rehabilitation would not be obturation. All she gets from this entirely intraoral resection, and if you see a barely perceptible scar in a neck skin crease on the left side, would be a thin skin line free flap. And your choices would include a radial forearm free flap, sometimes a lateral arm in very thin patients, and of course the MSAP. Perforator flaps, thin skin line flaps can really rehabilitate these patients well in preserved alveolus. This is something which is not in the purview of any defect class, but as you, as you would probably agree, for total nasal reconstruction, it's good to go back to the basics. Uh, it's uh, a supratrochial artery flap is, is really the workhorse and it actually restores form very, very well indeed. As you can see in this elderly lady, the different stages of the flap, the initial inset, and of course the, the POD is zero picture and after the pedicle has been divided. Uh, Zaid and Kent have published extensively as well as uh, elegantly on the role of inner reconstruction with a free flap and outer reconstruction with a paramedian forehead flap because it really restores skin. You have to make sure that, of course, the hair uh, bearing part of the skin does not get transferred. Or of course, even if it does, you have to do some depilation or some techniques. But largely, uh, this would be the standard in dorsal nasal reconstruction for most of our patients, especially PS2 and 3. When we start uh, talking about uh, the maxilla, and this is a very common tumor that we see, upper GBS, which should be considered a correlate of the early cyanonasal tumor, T2 or T3 at most. Uh, we looked at this technique at our institution. This had not been published before. Uh, an iliac crest bone graft, a corticocancellous graft, sandwiched between a radial forearm free flap on both sides. We were 15 odd cases. We had two exposures of the ICBG, and one of them had radiation. But I still think that based on our preliminary experience, we yet to publish that and uh, have not presented it in anything except this single slide format. But what's important is that, uh, that you do consider it for patients who don't have anticipated radiation. Patients have good outcomes, and this is another patient who was reconstructed with this technique. You have an ipsilateral filtral crease, which is concealing the scar, and the intraoral uh, appearance can be seen a few months after surgery. Moving on, uh, if you have this defect, which is, which is usually a challenging defect, the lower uh, 
th- uh, the the mid the lower third of the mid face in which you might or might not have premaxilla incorporated what we move to largely because these patients will typically require adjuvant therapy we move to a radial forearm osteocutaneous or an osteofascial cutaneous tree flap the skin island as you see will be inside uh, in this patient because the palate has been preserved but there'll be there'll be a posterior palatal defect i'm sorry the alveolus has been preserved and this allows green sticking it may not allow implants but the gross reality of uh, cancer treatment in our institution is that uh, and most of the country i think a small minority are implanted we did an audit on this about 5% is the disappointingly low number of patients who get implants so yes if you are considering implants if the patient has been counseled for implants and if he or she could benefit from that then make sure that you talk about uh, implants at the outset and don't do that flap in that case you do a better bone containing flap but uh, but this is a good option for class 1 defects if radiation is again not anticipated i know smriti talked a little bit about tumors in which you would not anticipate radiation therapy after the section and i'll take the discussion further in case you are uh, you have non squamous histology we already talked about brief indications of radiation therapy you might consider using some bone grafts and of course the temporalis withstands radiation well but the problem is that it just is going to atrophy like all denervated muscles do uh, you might be able to preserve the deep temporal nerve uh, during harvest and that's usually a possibility but by and large you're looking at something especially when you get adjuvant therapy for the temporalis to really shrink so you can consider a multi buttress bony reconstruction with grafts in case radiation is not anticipated having said that if you are anticipating radiation therapy vascularized bone is the way to go you don't want to rely on the uh, template of the face which is going to be radiated for the baseline vascularity and again some examples in which you do that moving forward in interest of time again when you have a multi buttress reconstruction of the fibula by multi buttress again for the trainees i mean something which reconstructs the naso alveolar the naso palatine buttresses the zygomatico maxillary and of course more importantly the superior alveolar buttress to make sure that you can eventually get implants the fibula is our go to what you call a total maxillectomy with or without an orbital floor preservation would typically be something for which the fibula would be would be the standard go to flap there are of course issues with regard to pedicle length but yes you can contour it to make sure that you do it use distally based perforators and keep the pedicle longer uh, and of course i'll take this discussion further uh, if anyone has any questions later on about the fibula but in the interest of time we'll move on in india of course we can't end a discussion about maxillary reconstruction without talking about the indian cancer the gbs cancer so in maxilla or infratemporal fossa skull base defects where the mandible is preserved we prefer soft tissue reconstruction if the segmental mandibulectomy has been done our institutional philosophy is if the patient has trismus or uh, an absent condyle we'll do a soft tissue reconstruction but if there is no trismus and preserved condyle then we do a bony reconstruction typically the fibula for a defect like the lower uh, right side that you see and uh, of course there are other options as well but nothing will reconstruct this extent of bone better than the fibula in case you have trismus preoperatively or if you have an absent condyle with two soft tissue reconstruction here you have a representative picture of a large anterolateral thigh free flap and that would be our go to another defect that defies classification it's not been included is a classic orbital defect uh prosthesis are a great option but sometimes for prosthesis as well there's some skin lining that is required especially in this patient where you have some filamentous leak from the orbital apex and in that case it's always good to have a flap reconstruct that area again a temporalis would be as good as long as the temporal contour is not very important to the patient and as long as the head is going to be uh, under hair or some head gear but the radial forearm free flap served our value fairly well and these patients again are still amenable to prosthetic restoration the radial forearm free flap is something we've done a lot of work on this is what the second ever study done on patterns of venous anatomy and we explored the vena anastomotica but that's a topic for another time the last kind of defect i'll talk about before uh, before we conclude is this large defect an orbital maxillary the skull base has been incorporated uh, the lids and the palate have been incorporated uh, this is not a candidate for prosthetic rehabilitation you'll have to go with a large flap I, and our choices are either the alt plus vastus or in this case a rectus abdominis tree flap both of them based on patient habitus satisfy our requirements in the vast majority of instances no discussion on reconstruction can be complete without talking about the reconstruction adjuncts I skipped the part where orbital support had to be discussed because I was concerned about finishing it in about 20 minutes. Uh, but orbital floor support is extremely important, and usually the fibula buttress or a bone graft is not able to do justice. On the left side, you're seeing the pericranium, which is extremely important for isolated skull-based reconstruction, where volume and bulk is not required. And of course, we're seeing the harvest side of a split calvarial bone graft, which is also frequently used for smaller defects. So, in summary, 
we'll have two summary slides. The first one will try to summarize optimizing oncological outcomes. Upfront surgery is the treatment of choice in resectable disease. And we've talked about that. And it's extremely important to hammer home the point among our, all our ENT and oncology colleagues that for resectable disease, surgery should be considered. Uh, like Smriti expounded in detail, and, uh, and as I briefly alluded to, uh, cranioendoscopic or endonosal endoscopic approaches can be considered in appropriate cases, but case selection is extremely important. And remember, stage histology and expertise. We talked a little bit about adjuvant radiation with or without chemotherapy and IMRT, so I'll skip through that. There is some evidence for cisplatin-based regimens. So yes, if the patient has good performance status, but with unresectable disease, do consider incorporating cisplatin and talk to your medical oncology colleagues during the board about that. Elective neck management, we've again talked about these two indications and it's important that we realize that these two indications would be the more common ones, T3 and T4 squamous, which are being managed surgically and poorly differentiated carcinoma. There is evidence of benefit. In that. When we talk about reconstructive outcomes, uh, there are conventional techniques that, uh, that have a huge role in reconstruction of sinonasal and skull-based defects, but microvascular as well, as we've talked about. The type of tissue requirement at the resection site should be the primary basis of lab selection. Especially in large tumors, it's ex extremely important to defer the second or the reconstructive harvest team uh, to a little later so that you know what exact defect you're anticipating so that the appropriate flap can be harvested. Otherwise, you'll end up having issues with facial contour and dystopia for the rest of their lives. And remember, secondary reconstruction is extremely challenging in the maxilla and the skull base. And develop a preoperative plan like we talked about and develop a patient-specific or a defect-specific algorithm for layered reconstruction whenever you're transgressing the CSF barrier and keep at least one life prep from about 15 years of reconstructive surgery, I can definitely tell you that it's extremely important to do this because sometimes you might have uh, resected so much that your harvest uh, would not be possible. For instance, taking the IMAX in sinonasal cancers, which is very common, might obviate the temporalis. So always have one more life boat prep so that you save as much time in these extensive resections. I thank you again, uh, the Delhi AOI, Dr. Saurav, for kindly coordinating the session. Dr. Uh, Ishwar and uh, Dr. Uh, Ravi for uh, giving me this invitation. All members of the Radio UI, it's, it's a family that I'm glad to be part of. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shamit. Uh, it was a very wonderful presentation. I have just first one question. Have you touched about uh, Dr. James Brown uh, classification? He is very much proponent of uh, scapula flap for uh, uh, maxilla. So what is your take on that? Because we usually do the fibula most of the time. <clears throat> so actually the, the defects for which you would consider the scapula and the fibula are a little different. Uh, the tip of scapula flap, which uh, James Brown, as well as most North American reconstructive surgeons now propose, is for small anterior defects. So we've done about five scapulae now. And uh, we are very much at the beginning of this. And you know, Amrita and Tata have been doing a fair bit more. Uh, I would still consider that the scapula is a good choice for when you need to reconstruct the anterior and the anterolateral walls. And when you have a total maxillectomy, uh, which requires orbital flow support by a buttress along with a mesh, and when you need to reconstruct at least three buttresses, fibula would still be the standard. Uh, that being said, I totally agree with you. The fibula would be, uh, would can easily be contoured to reconstruct one or two uh, buttresses also, as much as three. In fact, one or two buttresses will make it easier because your pedicle will be longer and you can actually take it to the neck. But that being said, it's an important point. I think scapula is really the way forward as we look towards more limited maxillary reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will... Uh, uh, Shamit, I got a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you said we can use uh, iliac crest also. But there's a deep circumflex uh, artery that has a very short pedicle. Where do anosmos in such a case where you have small pedicle? Because the common uh, anosmos size is facial artery or superior thyroid artery in the neck. Yeah. In uh, maxilla reconstruction, where do do the anosmosis? So, sir, this is, a, this is a great point that you pointed out. When I said iliac crest, I actually mentioned our small series of using corticocancellous iliac crest bone graft sandwiched with a radial forearm free flap. We've not used the DCIA free flap for maxillary reconstruction. Uh, there are two options, however, to answer the second part of your question. You can have the STA and the STV that you can anastomose to, especially when they've not been taken in the neck. Uh, we don't use reverse vascularity for that. We use upfront vascularity. Uh, there is also an option of interposition vein grafts. But, uh, but yes, to take uh, Saurabh's previous point further and to take your query further, uh, there are better options than the DCIA for maxillary reconstruction. Currently, the few DCIAs that, that have been done by our center have only been for short mandibular defects where a long pedicle was not required. 
Dr. Saurabh, may I ask one question, if that's okay with yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Dr. Shamit, wonderful presentation. Uh, regarding functional outcome, I was wondering how often do you do stenting of lacrimal duct? Yeah, so uh, we do it. We do it in every case where the lacrimal apparatus is is disrupted. And again, I'm sorry, I, I do not see your name next to it. But uh, but again, very relevant question. Uh, when we initially planned the talk with the the inputs by Dr. Saurabh, Dr. Ravi, and Professor Ishwar, I had thought of mentioning uh, the importance of orbital floor support, lacrimal stenting, and everything. It's very relevant. I'm glad you asked that question. Whenever you are doing anything that is going past the nasomaxillary suture line superiorly, you can fairly be certain that the lacrimal sac or the more distal part of the lacrimal apparatus will be disrupted. So we will stent all these cases. The important point is when you are doing when you are doing that, you have a big problem finding that distal end of the lacrimal stent. So my tip to all of you would be. In case you are doing something which is going to near obliterate the nasal cavity, leave a very long loop even coming out of the ipsilateral nostril so that you can remove it comfortably later. Uh, if you have a, a wide open nasal cavity and the reconstruction is more anterolateral and you still feel compelled to stenting, then in that case, of course, you can leave a short of stump. That's something that we've learned the hard way. We've learned a couple of times before we had to realize that we had to remove it. But, but very relevant point, I would stent every case where the resection is extending up to that. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. So we can uh, move to the yes, next uh, uh, next presentation. Uh, so I think we have already uh, uh, it's seven o'clock. So we have one more presentation. So Dr. Karan will present uh, the next uh, topic: the recent advances in uh, management of parental uh, sinus tumor. Uh, Dr. Deepak Singh is supposed to do it, but uh, at the last moment he has some family engagement. So now Dr. Karan will do it from for it. Okay, Karan, please. Yeah. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks to AY Delhi and the office bearers for this opportunity. So, this talk had to be done by Dr. Sareen, but due to some unforeseen circumstances, he couldn't uh, do this, and I'm doing it on his, his behalf. So, basically, my job has been made very easy by uh, Dr. Smriti and Dr. Shamit. So, Dr. Shamit has taken us through a case of paranasal sinuses, how these cases need to be managed. And my job is now to talk about what are the recent advances in paranasal sinus malignancies. Uh, so greetings from my hospital. Also, uh, when we talk about paranasal malignancies, it has been uh, repeatedly uh, brought forward by Dr. Smriti and Dr. Shamit that they are rare head and neck malignancies and constitute about three to five percent of the upper airway digestive malignancies and less than one percent of total malignancies. What is specific and special about the paranasal malignancies is that it's a vast heterogeneous group of cancers. There are multiple cells of origin. It has varied tumor histology. There are varied molecular characterization. And even with similar histologies, there are different clinical profiles and there is vast different difference in prognosis between various pathologies. Uh, just to bring forward the point, this is the WHO classification third edition of paranasal and paranasal and the nasal cavity sinus malignancies. And we can see there are more than 70 varied histopathological variations of malignancies which were there. Uh, whenever we talk about advancement in management, we talk about advances in investigation and advancement in treatment. The gold standard for it, diagnosis of a paranasal malignancy is still biopsy. And immunohistochemistry helps in diagnosis as well as differentiating various types of pathologies and histo various types of and the subset of various pathologies. And but the problem is sometimes biopsy and IHC is not enough. It cannot tell us about a particular type of malignancy and it cannot differentiate between various types of tumors. So with the advent of new generation, next generation sequencing and fluorescence in situ hybridization and other molecular genetic studies that has opened a very important avenue in both diagnosis and therapy of these tumors. With, with the advent of new next generation sequencing, we could identify different histopathological variants and we could also identify some actionable mutation in these in these variation in these variants which had specific targeted therapy available which could improve some out oncological outcomes for the dismal prognosis of these variations uh, so, so this is basically the fish technique which led to a, a diagnosis and identification of something known as a smart b deficient sinonasal carcinoma and with 
the advancement in the next generation sequencing and fish with the fourth edition who classification of paranasal sinus these were the variants which were added to the already huge list of paranasal malignancies which were present and these were the tumors which were classically labeled as sinonasal undifferentiated malignancy but because of the advancement in uh, next generation sequencing and molecular genetics we could differentiate various pathologies and what is important is that all these tumor mutations have specific target therapies which which i'll bring about subsequently the next important uh, point in diagnosis of these tumors after histopathological confirmation is the imaging and as dr smriti and uh, dr shamit said ct and mri are the standard investigations and both of them are complementary to each other ct has the advantage of easy access cost effectiveness better anatomical differentiation and better bony details whereas mri gives us a better contrast enhancement and gives us better soft tissue delineation but with recent improved protocols of mri like the diffusion weighted imaging and the apparent diffusion coefficient or the adc it mri can also work as an imaging biomarker what that means is that with mri we can differentiate between benign and malignant pathologies and mri can help us differentiate up and give us a differential diagnosis to difficult pathologies which are similar looking on histopathology the next in line of imaging which during the work up is sorry for that is the standard 18 fdg pet ct and we order pet ct for locally advanced malignancies of paranasal sinus as a distinct metastatic work up but recently there have been multiple new tracers which are being developed for pet ct and why this is exciting is that these new tracers can solve multiple problems for diagnosis delineation of the tumor assessment of tumor response differentiating tumor related changes like pseudo progression to radiation necrosis to tumor progression which might be difficult on an mr or a ct and certain tumor mark and newer tracers can help in new invasive assessment of tumoral uh, immune cell infiltration and can also tell us and predict the response to immunotherapy for these malignancies and the various pet ct tracers which are under evaluation for paranasal malignancies and paranasal sinus tumors are the standard 18 fluoro deoxy glucose 18 fluoro dopa 18 fluoro uh, meso and 18 fluoro faza with meso and faza what is essential and important to understand is these are hypoxic markers what that means is a lot of paranasal sinus malignancies are have low mitotic activity and usually hypoxic cellularity and more hy hypoxic the cell lesser the fdg avidity so these tumors will not take fdg that avidly avidly as a rapidly dividing tumor so these are the nuclear markers which can help in proper delineation of the tumor another interesting uh, pet marker recently been utilized for pns malignancies is the 68 gallium psma pet and this is a non prostatic indication of a psma pet it has been seen that adenoid cystic carcinoma and some salivary malignancies of the paranasal sinus and the head and neck malignancies take up psma so any tumor which is avid on 68 gallium psma pet like this case in point this case of adenoid cystic carcinoma has multiple lung meds which were avid on fdg pet and was also avid on psma gallium 68 pet and subsequently this patient was offered lutetium psma therapy for radio ablation of these metastases after all conventional treatments were exhausted so with these newer pet tracers we can delineate the tumors better differentiate the treatment response better and also have some newer modalities of treatment with radio ablation and if i'm right even aims published uh, some work on use of gallium 68 psma pet for juvenile nasal angiofibroma imaging and also for salivary gland malignancies of head and neck so coming to the next part of the talk which is the treatment and as dr shamit and dr smriti rightly said that surgery is the mainstay of treatment and radiation and chemotherapy are adjunct and have usually been a uh, usually have played an adjuvant role but in certain conditions the patient may receive upfront radiation or chemotherapy where surgical resections were not feasible and with the recent advent of targeted therapy and immunotherapy again this is a promising uh, promising branch of uh, study for uh, paranasal sinus malignancies and we have already seen that 
whenever endonasal endoscopic approaches can be done those are the preferred approach because it has better functional outcome it has better or cosmetic outcome but all paranasal malignancies cannot be treated by endoscopic approaches like for a maxillary sinus uh, cancer like in this patient he had a squamous cell carcinoma of the maxillary sinus requiring a total maxillectomy the open approach is the standard approach the point is that uh, the surgical approach for maxillectomy hasn't really changed over last couple of decades and a maxillectomy is what a maxillectomy was done 30 years ago is what we do today but what has really changed is the rehabilitation and reconstructive options that we present to these patients like dr shamit presented a brilliant case series of uh, free fab reconstructions so we have we have moved from not reconstructing to local flaps to pedicle flaps to microvascular soft tissue reconstruction to microvascular free flap bony reconstructions to something what we do now is 3d cad cam planning reconstructions for these defects and this is what we do at medanta that all such patients who are planned for maxillary or bony uh, resections and reconstructions they undergo the fine thin uh, slice ct scans of the face and bilateral limbs the re the uh, 3d reconstruction of the face is done we plan osteotomies and uh, the defect is planned pre uh prior to the prior to taking the patient to this uh, or and osteotomies are planned on the 3d reconstruction model itself and subsequently we uh, print 3d printed guides for these osteotomies to make sure that what we plan is what we deliver to the patient and once this 3d reconstruction is done uh the fibula is harvested and with the cutting guides reconstructed in the form we want on the table itself and the whole assembly is brought as one piece and fixed with mini plates at the surgical defect these are the x rays of the patient post surgery showing the reconstruction being done and this is the one year post op profile of the patient this is the closest cosmetic outcome we could give to this patient based on the 3d planning another point in uh, point another case to discuss was this international patient who came to us she had a, a multiple surgeries on the uh, right lower a uh, light right mandible for an osteogenic lesion she had a similar uh, lesion on the left maxilla for which she had been operated outside and part of the palate and teeth were taken out she was she wanted some dental rehabilitation at the same time and again we did something known as a 3d uh, cam card planning for this patient the mandible or the maxilla was reconstructed preoperatively using the ct images the osteotomies were planned on the reconstruction on the 3d reconstructed images uh, subsequently the osteotomies were planned on the fibula as well as the osteotomies were planned for its fixation into the surgical defect and based on these reconstructions we printed these reconstructive guides this is the guide of the maxilla with the uh, defect which was required this is the cutting guide which is required for the fibula osteotomies and this is the cutting guide we use at the local site for uh, cutting the maxilla mandible in the required shape we uh, we printed another guide for for giving the shape to the reconstruction plate so that there is minimal discrepancy between the reconstructive plate and the osteotomies and the fibula graft subsequently the dental rehabilitation was done at as the fibula was being reharvested and the uh, implants were put into the fibula the whole the whole assembly with the dental implants was put into the surgical defect which was uh, constructed using the cutting guides this is the one year post operative patient uh, image of the patient and this is the dental rehabilitation she received after 8 months of the surgery uh there have been some uh cadaveric studies on further advancement of robotic transorbital and transnasal approach for uh, skull based surgery and nasopharyngeal and paranasal sinus surgeries but these are all feasibility studies and all cadaveric studies with no uh, live patient data till now but this is an exciting field of study with advancements in robotics there can be advancement in robotic endoscopic guided surgeries for this area the next armamentarium in treatment of paranasal sinus is radiotherapy and as dr shamit rightly said right now the standard of care is imrt 
And we have come a long way from 3D conformal to IMRT, VMAT, and IGRT based photon therapies. But over the last couple of decades, there has been a great excitement about particle radiotherapy, and that is proton and carbon ion. And just to uh, bring in focus the difference between IMRT and proton is image A is the IMRT fields for paranasal sinus with. Uh, uh, these are the IMRT fields, and we can see that the organs and rest, like the orbits and the brain, receive a fair share of radiation. Whereas when you compare it to the proton, there is a very rapid fall off for organs at risk, and there is minimal radiation which is received by organs at risk. So this is one of the major advan advantages of particle radiotherapy. Uh, and particle radiotherapy, be it proton or carbon ion, if you talk about Indian context, it is proton. There are there are many favorable radiological radiobiological properties. One is the Bragg peak. That is, there is a sudden drop in radiation dosage after a particular depth of infiltration of the radiation beam. So the organs at risk do not receive any radiation or minimal radiation with minimizing the side effects. The particulate radiotherapy have high linear energy transfer. What that means is that there is higher cellular damage and they are more active on tumors which were considered to be radio resistant. These have higher relative biological effectiveness. They have higher oxygen enhancement ratio. Again, tumors which are hypoxic are usually more radio resistant, but particulate radiotherapy is again more effective for oxygen and for hypoxic tumors as compared to IMRT. And there is minimal lateral, lateral scaring, scattering. What that means is that all the radiation is concentrated to the area where you want radiation to be focused on. And the surrounding normal tissue receives minimal radiation dose, which is possible. And this is the meta-analysis and the systematic review uh, published by Patel and et al. from Mayo Clinic, published in Lancet Oncology in 2014. And they studied uh, 43 studies which compared proton uh, particulate particle radiotherapy to assist to photon therapy. And they, they concluded that five-year survival and five-year disease-free survival and local regional control rates were much better with proton beam therapy with minimal side effects and decreased dosage to organs at risk. But all these studies are retrospective. So there is a need for more prospective data to evaluate uh, the particulate radiotherapy for paranasal sinus. The third armamentorium in treatment of paranasal sinuses is the systemic therapy. And inclusion of systemic therapy is done for selected histologies. And it may improve local regional control. It may reduce frequency of distant metastasis and as Dr. Shamit pointed out, it can give longer survival for patients with unresectable disease. And systemic therapy can be given as two modalities in your treatment of paranasal sinuses. One is a part of multimodality treatment, like an adjuvant chemo radiation, which is like extrapolated from normal head and neck malignancies, or as a part of as new adjuvant chemotherapy for locally advanced cancers. And when you give new adjuvant chemotherapy, there are certain indications or certain aims that you give it with. One is to improve surgical resectability and improve negative margins. The second is all paranasal sinus tumors are in close proximity to orbit. And orbital preservation with new adjuvant chemotherapy is one of the major reasons of giving new adjuvant chemotherapy for locally advanced cancers. Thirdly, it can help in chemo bioselection. Like certain tumors which respond to new adjuvant chemotherapy do better on subsequent treatment, whereas tumors which do not respond to NACT are, are found to have poorer prognosis. It can improve oncological outcomes. And in new adjuvant setting, you can give multiple drugs together at higher dosage with minimal toxicity. And these toxicities can be mediated. And whatever dose you want to give, you can give without any compromise. So these are the various common histopathologies for which new adjuvant chemotherapy have been tried. The most common pathology in paranasal sinus is a squamous cell carcinoma, and it's a heterogeneous group of disease from moderately differentiated to well differentiated to poorly differentiated tumors. And all these tumors do differently. For, and new adjuvant, usually what the world literature says that about 60% of all squamous cell carcinomas will respond to new adjuvant chemotherapy. And a response to new adjuvant chemotherapy is an important prognostic indicator for squamous cell carcinoma. So if a tumor responds, the subsequent outcomes are much better. And 
addition of anti egfr uh, drugs like cetuximab to new adjuvant chemotherapy can further improve the response rates and subsequently oncological outcomes the second the next second pathology which has been studied for new adjuvant chemotherapy is the intestinal type of adenocarcinoma again a varied group again with different response rates and a study by lesetra it all showed that p53 status was a predictor predictor of response to induction therapy and tumors which responded to induction therapy subsequently did better with better overall survival and disease free survival the third tumor which is which is for which new adjuvant chemotherapy is usually tried is olfactory neuroblastoma and this is usually tried for cadish c or cadish d type of tumors and one of the standard new adjuvant treatment is the vac regime or the vac regime which is based on cyclophosphamide with crestin with or without adriamycin followed by radiation and then surgery and patients who responded to the vac regime had an overall survival in the tune of 60 to 70 percent that to a 10 year survival at the end uh, i would talk about few targeted therapies which are coming for paranasal sinuses with advent of next generation sequencing and fish we could identify some actionable mutations in all of these malignancies and we had certain targeted therapies which could be used for these malignancies which have led to sub- i'll not say substantial but some improvement in survival for as such for tumors which had dismal uh, prognosis with standardized treatment like for squamous cell carcinoma with addition of anti egfr drugs or anti pdl1 drugs like cetuximab nivolumab or pembrolizumab there have been improvement in oncological outcomes for inter- for intestinal uh, type of adenocarcinoma we can use anti pdl1 uh therapy or anti keras therapy again which has improved survival there is ctla4 antibody like ipilimumab then nut cancers we can use anti nut inhibitors like bromodine and many more and like idh inhibitors like enantiomab so in the end i would like to conclude that it is an exciting time for paranasal sinus malignancy management there are rapid advancements being done both for investigation and treatment and hopefully over the next decade or so we would have prospective data on all these advancements and you have newer targeted therapy and newer investigational modalities which can help improve oncological outcomes for these tumors thank you thank you dr karan it was a very good presentation i just have a question when you did cat cam uh, Uh, to use cat cam for the maxilla re- reconstruction we we are using for the uh, medib at present but for the maxilla we have tried there will be always if you want to do a dental rehabilitation in the maxilla there will always be a gap between the zygoma and the posterior uh, segment where you do a osteotomy because otherwise uh, it will be tilted a little bit more so that is if you are going to do a dental lesion in the maxilla then there will be a gap between the zygoma and the posterior part of posterior segment of the uh, reconstructive fibula so so that's a very valid point sir so mm-hmm. our reconstructive surgeons have some have uh, sometimes done something known as one and a half uh, osteotomy for the fibula so they do a 100 one and a half barreling of fibula so that half barrel of fibula takes a, takes into account the difference in height between the zygoma and the premaxilla and subsequently that assembly okay. doesn't move that much so this is a great point with sorov's permission i'd like to comment a little bit on this uh the the importance of what uh, current pointed out is 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 there is is worth reiterating uh, when you take that zygomatico maxillary buttress reconstruction the fibula does not exactly mimic it because the zygomatico maxillary buttress is a three dimensional structure with the fibula you are essentially doing two dimensional reconstruction so it's sometimes helpful like dr sorov said to either leave a 1 cm gap between the between the zygoma and that area because remember in the maxilla you're not relying on osseo integration you're only doing a uh, form reconstruction the other option is to maybe do a 2 cm segment and curve it upwards so that it's approximate to the zygoma but uh, karan i do echo dr saurabh's thoughts on cad cam for maxilla the reason we don't use it for cad uh, for maxilla is because uh, again everyone's rates of dental rehabilitation are not very high and i think i, I speak on behalf of everyone who does this in our country at least it's not covered by insurance and most of these patients are but yes uh, inverse planning can help you rehabilitate 
So what we do for maxilla in which we are expecting implants later on is to do an inverse plan, talk to our prosthetic people. They will ask us to, to contour it accordingly. And usually in the maxilla, another advantage is that you have the other hemi palate to contour. To. So you'll be able to get it right a lot of times, especially in bicortical bone like figure. Points absolutely agreed upon, sir. We also do CAD CAM majority for mandible, but yeah, so we have done about 10 odd cases for maxilla, and these were the few that I presented. So, yeah, we are also learning gradually as it uh, as we Shamit, move forward. Uh, Shamit, I have got a question for you. Yes. In case the zygoma is also involved, because sometimes the, you, when you have a patient who has late presentation, you have to do away with the part of the zygoma. Then where do we attach this lateral uh, part of the so-called new fabricated uh, assembly which you are going to attach to the zygoma? Sir, I would be very concerned about that tumor first from an oncological standpoint before reconstruction. Anything that is touching the zygoma is a, has this uh, waterfall effect and it would go supra-zygomatic supra into the temporal fossa. By definition, these tumors are unresectable. If you still get, let's say, a favorable histology, a giant cell tumor or something which is eroding the zygoma, then at that time, I'll have two priorities. One, because my lateral orbital support or the orbitozygomatic buttress is gone. If my resection is below the orbitozygomatic buttress, I will still be able to do bony reconstruction by using one of the Y-shaped plates or something to contour it to the orbitozygomatic buttress. If that is not possible without compromising the volume of the orbit, then I would just do a soft tissue reconstruction. Most of these tumors, if, it, if they are malignant and are going up to the suprazygomatic recess, are usually not amenable to, to definitive modality and then also state-of-the-art reconstruction. So, uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, now, also, I uh, welcome and thanks Dr. Uh, J.C. Pasi to attending this webinar. I welcome you, sir. And uh, now I will invite uh, none other than Dr. Anil Dikruz. Uh, Dr. Dikruz is a, at present UICC uh, president and also the chairman of Apollo Group of Hospital Oncology. Uh, sir, please uh, uh, take the stage. Uh, thanks, uh, Saurabh. Uh, thank you to the AOI Delhi branch for giving me an opportunity. As Shamit said, two of us are not outside from Delhi. At least I was born in Delhi and I love that city. So I'm half Delhi. I'm an integral part of the AOI Delhi. Thank you for having me over. Uh, Shamit, when he spoke, said that uh, we'll set the stage for the panel discussion. But I just want to say that I thought the three talks were excellent. The two youngsters on either side did brilliant. Of course, Amit speaks very well. And I don't know if they've set the stage or they've just stolen my thunder. I don't even think there's a need for a panel, but excellent talks. Uh, Smriti was very, very clear. Karan was excellent. And I can see in the chat box, many people appreciating it. And uh, Shamit, of course, is like as good as old wine. He's always good. Uh, so we've got this great panel. I'll try to, again, uh, put everything together. Uh, we've got a very, very well-balanced panel. I think the only person missing is a radiologist, but we are not going to be very technical on that. So we've got Ishwar, who's from MAMC. He's from the ENT background. Uh, Prof. Sham Agarwal is a very leading medical oncologist. Gagan is a very, very balanced uh, radiation oncologist, so we are happy to have him on board. Uh, Vipin uh, is again from the ENT ORL background from UCMS. Saurav is, of course, a, a dedicated head and neck surgical oncologist. Kapil again brings the balance of ORL and head and neck. Uh, DK, one of our uh, MCH candidates from the armed forces, is again a dedicated surgical oncologist uh, doing some part of ENT. So I think it's very, very balanced and Dipali brings in the pathology experience. Now, given that we've got many people on the panel and also great people who are part of the faculty and have been given the link, I just like everybody to chip in so at the end of this hour, we can get the, uh, the most and we can all take home a message. So please feel free to chip in anytime. I'm not going to ask anybody in particular. And in the interest of time and that we cover more, if you don't... 
you don't repeat what's happening someone's not happy with me or someone shouting in the background can those not speaking please mute their mics it will be better for the entire program uh i'm going to start with a thank you slide because i never get to my last slide on my panels and i want to thank all my colleagues who helped me uh, harsh particularly helped me put this presentation together and i can, i can see him is part of the link satakshi reecha uh, devendra shiva and deepa so the last four from tata some of our collection of slides thank you to all six of you all if you all are here but i thought let me acknowledge at the beginning otherwise i never reach to the last slide and i sometimes feel bad at the end of the program so we know that these tumors are difficult to treat a lot of what i've put up in this one busy slide has been said it's because they are rare 3% of all head and neck less than 1% of all cancers they present late sometimes the symptoms are very similar to benign conditions and we'll discuss that as we go along in the panel diverse histologies and close proximity to critical structures for adequate clearance but we also have a lot of pluses and these are just the uh, ones that we use now in addition to what karan shared which are in the pipeline we have great imaging uh, we have better optics and instruments to tackle these tumors we understand the biology better and diagnosis with ihc typing has really told us which ones we treat which way we have more aggressive surgery and reconstruction and it's come out in the last two talks so elegantly and also we have better radiation yes of course there's proton but even conventional radiotherapy with dose painting imrt igrt and the expanding role of chemotherapy both in terms of we understand where to use it and the new molecules has really balanced out the negatives of treating sinonasal when i started my career sinonasal most patients were dead in a year but over the years as you go through various series of publications you can make out that now we are making strides in the treatment of this cancer so i'm going to go over these six talks uh, ravi told me to be very basic sort of the uh, the moderator stroke coordinator has given me a set of questions that he said you must cover so we are going to look at diagnosis extent of disease establishing tissue diagnosis understanding biology development of a treatment plan role of radiotherapy and chemotherapy and a little bit about rehabilitation and i think a lot has already been covered in shamit's and karan's talk so case 1 a 55 year old lady for some of you all some of this may be a little basic but you can just let me know and i can step up on the accelerator no comorbidities underwent a fess operation for a left ac polyp at a native place you can see the very classical looking appearance on the ct scan unfortunately the hp came as squamous cell carcinoma biopsy reviewed by us showed a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma now the patient is asymptomatic so a lot of my practice given these optics of the endoscope a uh, lot of people just go in and remove every mass that they see and the biopsy comes as squamous cell carcinoma so uh how do we avoid this situation because this is truly now a dilemma how to treat this patient so any of the panelists if you all could take this questions maybe the surge onks first or maybe those from the orl background kapil ishwar yes sir. uh uh if you can how can we avoid this what message can we give all these youngsters ents who've got the endoscope in their hand uh remove some don't remove some give us some pointers fine sir so thank you so much sir it's always a pleasure to to be uh, under your guidance and uh, it's a proud moment to be a panelist in your panel so uh, as it was rightly mentioned that uh, this this is a group of uh, uh, clinicians who are uh, who are uh, learning and who are post graduates so 
they should uh, always remember their basics of uh, having differential diagnosis in mind while you are evaluating any case in particular. We as ORL or ENT specialists uh, see a lot of uh, sinonasal pathologies that are essentially inflammatory. And as you have mentioned that he had underwent phase for an entroconal polyp, they are fairly common pathologies, uh, inflammatory pathologies being uh, we are evaluating any such case. If you look at this particular case, had they taken the history very, very carefully, a 55 year old female, no comorbidities, uh, first differential diagnosis that should have been in your mind, of course, AC polyp is a differential, but it, it should have come a unilateral pathology, a nasal uh, mass in a 55 year old tumor, they should have thought on lines of a neoplastic lesion, either inverted papilloma or a malignancy. Uh, second point is uh, you have to do and carefully uh, analyze the radiology. There is obvious evident bone erosion in some areas which goes against uh, the diagnosis of entroconal polyp. It tells us that just a neoplastic lesion. And third is if you are going for a diagnostic endoscopy, it is a good idea uh, to do a radiology first and do a biopsy and come out rather than going for a, a complete excision if you are suspecting on lines of a uh, neoplasia, either an inverted papilloma or a uh, more so if it's a malignancy. So there are a few points. Radiology first, understand and appreciate the radiology findings. Do a diagnostic endoscopy. Looks are different. Endoconal polyp looks different from a malignancy. And do a biopsy if you have doubt and uh, let the treatment be decided on uh, on your histopathology rather than uh, an excision biopsy. Uh, may, may, uh, I, may I? I, 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 I just one at a time who's speaking okay. if you can identify yourself and then speak so that the delegates know who's speaking please sir ishwar here ha bolo sir. ishwar sir the uh, age is not in fa uh, favor of ac polyp secondly the look of the clinical look when the patient uh, gives the history of there must have been some bleeding in this simply nasal obstruction would have not be the only symptom the age was against AC polyps. Secondly, as uh, uh, Kapil said, the clinical examination should have been done thoroughly. And the uh, difference between a mass and the AC polyp, which is grayish white, uh, smooth uh, surface, and here it would have been at irregular bleeds on touch. All those clinical findings should have been taken into consideration before going up for taking up surgery. In the, in the clinical so examination would have given a clue to the uh, doctor, treating uh, surgeon. So I think great points made by two of y'all. You must look at the age. You must look at the clinical findings and look of the tumor. You must look at radiology. These are very, very important. But I've just put up that uh, uh, whether y'all would agree to these figures that I've put up in younger patients, chances of malignancy are much low. And as you go above the age of 50, the chances of malignancy are much, much, much higher. So youngsters list, uh, listening, please be aware that if you have a unilateral uh, or a persistent na nasal symptoms and like uh, Ishwar said with epistaxis, in 50% of time, the pathology will be other than chronic infection. And in addition to the age, you would have radiology to guide your diagnosis. And please do a biopsy if you are in doubt. There are other signs that we can see. And this is very, very basic. You can examine the face of thalamic signs. Cranial nerve palsies, this obviously goes with more advanced tumors. And sometimes even lymph nodes that are palpable would be able to give you a clue that you may be dealing with a, a, a malignant pathology. So we move to sir, imaging. Just, yeah, go sir, ahead. Sir, DK this side, sir. Yeah, go ahead, DK. Uh, sir, sir, just wanted to add uh, one thing regarding the biopsy also. The biopsy should be done in the most representative areas. So sometimes Absolutely. what happens is a polyp, so the polyp uh, which uh, protrudes in the nasal cavity, if you take a biopsy from there, it might come as inflammatory, which may be uh, misdiagnosed. Uh, mis Excellent. Uh, I, I think I've got a photograph of something like that coming up uh, and I'll ask you, but point is very correct. Sometimes we very quickly in the office tend to punch the front of the nose, particularly us guys 
वो आपकी और सर्जिकल हेड एंड नेक ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट एंड यू आर एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट द रिपोर्ट विल कम एज इन्फ्लेम्ड म्यूकोसा सो इट्स समटाइम्स ऑलवेज बेटर टू डू इट अंडर एंडोस्कोपी सी द मोस्ट रिप्रेजेंटेटिव पार्ट एंड देन टेक अ पंच कपिल डिड एल्यूड टू इमेजिंग एंड ही सेड आई कुड सी बोनी इरोजन कैन वन ऑफ योर ऑल टेल अस which Im- imaging is indicated when you have a patient who comes with pns symptoms nasal symptoms unilateral obstruction epistaxis should we go for ct should we go for mr should we go for pet sir uh, saurabh here so so yes, first sir. first so i was just uh, talking about that uh, earlier so first investigation unilateral mass with epistaxis i think uh, we should go for contrast in non ct scan yeah not the plain ct scan first of all and there will there can be sign of uh, a bony erosion there there can be a uh, uh, osteolysis can be there or uh, there can be a, uh, erosion also there erosion can be of because of the pressure also pressure erosion can be there but these are can be subtle signs on the uh, ct scan so first in let's do it c ct okay and be, uh, any CCD for endoscopic endoscopic okay so uh, uh, absolutely fine probably it's the first initial investigation to do a contrast in an ct scan shows the bony structures very very well uh vipin uh, could you chip in as to when you would do an mri in the cases when the disease is beyond the confines of the sinuses or which uh, like uh, advanced tumors in which there is subcutaneous extension or there is skin involvement uh, in those cases uh, or there is a suspected uh, or vital involvement or a suspected intracranial extension i would like to ask for a, a mri in those cases sir so so there are some structures that are better delineated in the mr do any of you all do a pet for <laughs> <laughs> lesions of the pns and nose the choice also uh, depends on yes uh, sorry sir kapil here <laughs> yeah kapil so choice also depends on the type of histology reporting yes as you uh, have mentioned uh, the first modality is almost invariably the ct scan and as saurabh mentioned uh, we almost uh, do a clinical evaluation and an endoscopy but uh, the choice of further investigations also depends upon the uh, histologic reporting there are some tumors which have more uh, propensity for distant metastasis and nodal metastasis and some for cranial extension as smriti and i talk mentioned about esthesio neuroblastoma there are some poorly differentiated tumors so if you encounter those type of histologies it is uh, it has to be a more thorough uh, systemic evaluation in terms of metastasis neck evaluation and intracranial Uh, extension and of course if you are making a decision making that is beyond your routine endoscopic excision or a maxillectomy then almost always mri would be indicated orbital decisions intracranial decisions and if tumor is anyways close to sphenoid sinus or there is extension much beyond uh, uh, paranasal sinuses uh, so, so, so sir solve solve yes sir sir yeah, i sir. i i will always if uh, first i will do the ct scan c ct and endoscopy biopsy if it is positive for malignancy i will always do mri also along with ct scan okay even so, if it is confined to maxillary sign okay so for clarity among the young practicing uh, head and neck surgeons and the students would it be fair to say that in the majority of patients the initial first workup is a ct scan with an endoscopic thara endoscopic evaluation ct does have some shortcomings and i've highlighted it here case in point large tumor seen uh, when you do an mr uh, you uh, see that a part of that so called tumor was just secretions it reached to a 30% over diagnosis due to tissue edema we supplement a large majority of our ct scans with an mr on points that uh, kapil highlighted and when we want to rule out distant metastases large nodes or a very very aggressive histology we would do uh, a pet scan would, would that be a fair summary of what we are uh, discussing may make a comment dr dikru dr sham yes yeah, sham please yeah so i think you put it uh, in the end i mean if you have adenocarcinoma or a small cell carcinoma you know getting in the diagnosis then i think a pet ct would be in order to look at the uh, you know 
metastasis or maybe a, a primary, you know, elsewhere. Absolutely. <laughs> so point well taken. MRI has a lot of advantages. Generally, it's a better imaging uh, when you are doing all these difficult cases. You see better soft tissue delineation, secretions vis-a-vis -vis tumor, dural neural involvement. Even for post-treatment follow-up, it's pretty good. It has a much better accuracy than the CT scan. But as all the panelists unanimously agree, I guess the first investigation that most of us do is a CT and sort of made a point very, very strongly. It should be contrast enhanced CT, which I think is important for everybody. So uh, I've just kind of summed up uh, uh, where we do these uh, MRIs over CTs, but I think all these points have been covered and in the interest of time, we will move, move on. Generally, the dictum with radi radiology is most tumors are non-specific on imaging. A tumor will not be diagnosed on imaging. They are iso to hypo intense on T1 weighted. They get hyper intense on T2 weighted. Again, for the postgraduates who are listening to us, they all enhance post contrast on both CT or MRI. But it's difficult for a radiologist to make specific diagnosis on the type of tumor. But in some cases, they can help us. So imaging is primarily to set the stage, the extent of the tumor. There are some tumors where you can make a clinching diagnosis. And I've highlighted some of them here. If any of y'all want to take any of these points, make a point, it will be great. Uh, I turn over back to the panelists because we don't have a radiologist. So anybody, uh, Vipin, Ishwar, Kapil, DK, any of you all can go. Even Gagan might go if he wants to make some. I just highlighted again for the postgraduates that sometimes imaging helps us to make a diagnosis. Sir, uh, uh, sir Gagan here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I would, uh, I would like to say that perhaps... Um, Inverted papilloma should also be added to the list because of its that cerebriform appearance, which can uh, give us a, a, a radiological diagnosis. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, a point well taken. I think when I discuss inverted, I do have a slide that would highlight something which is being developed. And I think Karan alluded to it in his uh, talk when you do those ADC values and various other things. Uh, anybody wants yeah. to talk? Anybody I wants would. to talk the youngsters? Huh? Vipin, you go yes. ahead. Just talk the youngsters yes, to these lists so that the points go in more uh, more strongly. Well, so just the list you have given, I would uh, go in that order. As far as the fungal sinusitis is concerned, uh, there are areas on CT scan, there are areas of hyperattenuation due to uh, accumulation of uh, uh, salts and uh, uh, calcification so you can you can easily make out plus with the clinical features like uh, greenish uh, uh, yellow green discharge and the history of atopy you can very well you can it is very easy to make out a fungal sinusitis uh, on a ct scan as far as a cisio neuroblastoma uh, is concerned it is uh, uh, you can uh, make out uh, whether it is attached to the upper vault of the nasal uh, fossa or if there is an intracranial extension, you will see a dumbbell-shaped tumor uh, in such a situation. Uh, MRI is particularly helpful in uh, uh, melanoma cases, and particularly because there are many satellite lesions uh, which might be non-melanotic. So on visual inspection, you might not be able to make out that this is a, a extent of melanoma uh, because of the non-melanotic segments, and MRI can definitely help in such cases. And uh, angiofibroma, uh, as you have, yeah. Go ahead, Vipin. Yeah. And uh, uh, osteosarcoma, sir, as you have told, that uh, there is a characteristic uh, a sun ray appearance uh, in uh, uh, osteosarcoma, and uh, uh, it will be a solid tumor rather than uh, uh, the one uh, like uh, uh, sinonasal cancers. And nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, we cannot uh, miss because of the age and the typical history with which these patients present and the characteristic uh, uh, enhancement they have on uh, CT scan, contrast and non-CT scan. So, so, so yeah, go ahead. That's great. Go ahead, Vipin, if you want. So the purpose of imaging is not only to map the disease, but is also to 
differentiate the non sinus non neoplastic diseases from the uh, neoplastic diseases so that we can plan ahead so so imaging sir we, we it is certainly very important uh, for uh, uh, assessment of sinus nasal masses uh, i just sir, sir, add, yeah yeah go ahead uh, saurav go ahead saurav yeah sir sir uh, so my take it on this yes sir, sir my my take on this uh, my the most beneficial part of doing imaging is if it is a vascular tumor or not because you have to differentiate the vascular tumor or not because before taking a biopsy rest is all differential diagnosis and you can confirm only on the biopsy true true uh, you must know the vascularity and i think that is standard teaching particularly in an ent orl department before you go and punch any lesion particularly if it's a young boy rule out naso pharyngeal angiofibroma yes there are some tumors in the paranasal sinuses that also bleed like hell so it's nice to know the vascularity so that your forewarned is forearmed but quickly for the youngsters the invasive fungal when you have a, a fungal sinusitis which is uh, chronic uh it enhances dif differently compared to tumors so most tumors enhance on a t2 image but the chronic fungal sinusitis will show up bright on a t1 uh it will be iso to hypo to a mildly hyper in t2 but t1 it will be very bright and the reason for this is that you may have iron salts in the fungal hyphae as opposed to in the t2 they could have zinc and manganese which are paramagnetic and can uh, light up a little bit so i always remember i don't come from an ent background but for me to look at this x ray and make out whether it's fungal of course vipin said the concretions and other things remember if you see that thing lighting up on t1 please consider fungal sinusitis over a tumor tumor lights up in t2 imaging so we come back to case 1 continuation and uh, antroconal polyp that was removed out in the in her native place uh, what do we now do for this patient the patient has had the polyp excised and it's very very common that we see these patients uh, do we repeat imaging do we do scopy what do we do for this patient do we just give radiotherapy we do resurgery what do we the line management of this patient yes, sir we would like to do the imaging in this case so that we can know the exact extent of the tumor which is left behind and then plan it depending on the uh, how much is the residual tumor there and uh, depending on the extent of the tumor the surgery will be planned if it is has been uh, i doubt it has been removed completely so uh, i like to do mri in this case so that we can know how much is the tumor left behind and then plan the things accordingly uh can't hear anybody uh, sir yes i think we, we lost see. dr anil dikos yes. i think his connection he will come back yes it will dr arora can i ask a question in the meantime yes yes yeah. sir yes sir you see we see similar patients referred to us from our ent colleagues when you have a diagnosis positive of malignancy so you know they always ask us shall we go ahead and do the endoscopic resection of as much as possible so what do you think you know should, should we be doing and what is your call on that of all the ent people sir as Sorry. much as is not uh, not the answer it's uh, it has bad. to be complete resection at least so okay. sir is here I, I'm back again. I'm sorry. I've got two. I've got I've got two net connections, and I'm just toggling between the two. And I've been on various webinars. I hope I've not finished my bandwidth. But anyway, uh, Ishwar, you said yes. We should image. What would be the imaging? If you can please highlight, would it be an MR or a CT? The MR will be better, sir. 
Okay, great point. So for post-operative assessment, we always do an MR. Here is the MR for y'all. Suggestive of post-operative changes, mucosal thickening along the maxillary sinus walls. Next. Sir, sir may, uh, may I? Okay. So I, I want to see, even if it yeah. is a non-contrast non CT scan, pre-operatively, I want to see all the sections for that. Uh, uh, so that we have a little bit idea and mapping where that tumor was earlier. नहीं तो वो अब पूरी सब मैं पूरी CT scan की sequence दिखाऊं नहीं नहीं सर यार और अब नहीं for sir sir practical purpose he is talking about sir sir practical not not now sir I just wanted कि as we should okay it's a good idea but you will never know even if it was a large uh, antroconal polyp they have told you they've totally excised i think i agree with the uh, with with uh, ishwar that i would do a post op mri your point is well taken you will correlate these shadows now with the pre operative shadows to see if there's anything so here i've given you the mr what will you do next uh, ishwar anybody kapil uh, dk uh, how will you manage so i put up the mr they have said it's probably post operative changes Sir, since the antrum these are all real life patients sir this is not we can take the biopsy sir this is uh, i am sure that there is a residual yeah, tumor ye ye hai aapki endoscopy picture i think sir there is a tumor in this so you have, he has not uh, removed it completely which is visible on mri uh, we so, have taken we have taken multiple biopsies and here are the report for you on the right So may I just add a point? I'm sorry, I'm intervening. Yeah, Harsh yeah. Sir, so I would just also like to go, go back ahead, and Harsh. review the. Hi, sir. So I would just like to go back and review the initial imaging as well because uh, earlier Dr. Sikta also said that there were some signs of bone erosion. So a poorly differentiated squamous cell CA with bone erosion. I would just want to look at the earlier imaging as well. So point so well fine. taken, Harsh. But there are certain subtle bone erosions. You might say it's eroded. I might say it's not. You might take five. If it's frank erosion, anybody sure. in your OPD, the junior most person on the service, will tell you, sir, this right. bone is eroded sir, and uh, it's bad. Sir, so it's subtle. Uh, we are so, not sure. So sir, sir, it is a it is a recurrent or residual tumor uh, suspected. Uh, in this case, I will. Uh, uh, Ask Kapil if we can do a, a medial maxillectomy kind of uh, thing, completely resection, and in that specimen we should see the tumor is that residual tumor or not is there. Sir, uh, one thing uh, a practical issue that I want to highlight here is that most cases where they are suspecting an inflammatory lesion, the radiology is not that accurate. They will just have uh, limited uh, correct scans and sections, and uh, it, it will be very difficult to go back and assess and exactly stage the disease. So this is a definitely a difficult situation to tackle. And as Saurav said, uh, if you if you go to the images of MRI, it is almost a medial maxillectomy that has been done in in this particular case. It, it, it seems definitely more, more than the simple entrocornal polyp excision. And you definitely see there is some thickening on the lateral wall, uh, which which on biopsy is negative. So we are in a fix whether. Uh, uh, a, what was the stage of disease? Had it been an early stage, probably it has been excised quite well and adequately uh, in pre previous surgery and uh, patient now does not have disease. And second issue is that there is some hidden focus of disease which we are missing. Uh, uh, so so how, do we, how do we manage this patient? So uh, I agree with Ishwar that we have done the MRI scan. I agree with couple that the antrum is wide open. I may not agree with Saurav to send the patient back to Kapil to do further surgery now. I don't sir, know sir. what Kapil is going to do. Sir, sir, uh, sir if I can, uh, can yeah, I just... Go ahead. Just... Anybody? Yes, sir. Yeah, please. So I think in these, uh, we do get such cases, sir, on a regular basis. Patients have been operated in uh, uh, UP and uh, Haryana and then they come back without any even report also. So this is a this is a norm for us. So I think uh, we always ask our residents to talk back to the ENT surgeon. We've been Delhi also, <laughs> Bombay also maybe, and even and even in the US, my friend, because yes. the endoscope is so easily available, it yes. happens to all so of us. Comes, These are very very yeah. common in our practice. Yeah. So here comes our ENT experience, sir. I think. Uh, 
uh, we would like to take uh, biopsy from this patient uh, what was the intention of the surgeon that is important to us are vipin vipin i am going to interject here you are, i have to yet meet a surgeon who will not tell you he operated for cure or maine sab tumor nikali ki nahi wo bolega maine sab nikal di you show me one surgeon who you have phoned and says yaar maine to 50 मार्जिन पॉजिटिव सर्जरी so i think uh, we will refer this patient to the radiation oncologist for a uh, adjunct radiation sir so uh, that's that's it's what i did we treated this patient in 2017 and follows up with me now it seems to be doing well with no recurrence of disease gagan chip in here you get a patient with this kind of tx tumor how comfortable are you to continue radiotherapy or would you send the patient back for any added tests or you would be comfortable i sent to my radiation oncologist treated what sir, are your concerns when you see a tx tumor sir the uh, uh, thank you sir so the uh, most important concern that i'll have is the where the patient is coming from to me if the patient is say coming from uh, you or from saurav or from any of the esteemed panelists i know that due considerations have been made for any surgical intervention and now the radiation is the only option which of course i too feel because uh, there is really no residual disease and uh, they have done uh, an endoscopic almost like a complete resection uh, so i will be comfortable doing uh, radiation therapy uh, doing uh, after maybe a discussion of the mri you know i will do an, i'll do a customary discussion with of the mri with my radiologist as in if there is anything residual or anything i have to focus or something like that so i will be doing radiation that's the answer to the question sir uh, <clears throat> uh sir i'm just uh, wondering that uh, if there is one thing to go back uh, to the surgeon uh, maybe not to ask him about the completeness of surgery but is there is there any benefit of going back to the <clears throat> the histopathology as in uh, <clears throat> maybe somebody can comment on the margins or something is, is, is there any role of anything like that at all just, just uh, out of curiosity in my book and i think smriti brought this up in a presentation uh, it would be all piece meal i'm not sure any- anybody could do margins unless they removed all the tumor and then from the residual area like we do in endoscopic sinus surgery go into the frontal sinus take out a little bit of mucosa take out from the itf take out a little bit of fat near the orbit and send it that's okay but otherwise it's very difficult we'll have dipali to comment on that if you get a fes uh, a specimen are you able to tell margins is dipali there yes sir So good evening good evening everyone so uh, yeah as this is an endoscopic procedure we get piecemeal or fragmented biopsy tissues in which it is very hard to tell about the margins unless you send us uh, separately sent tissue pieces like you know from the area of interest you would like to know whether the tumor is there or not unless and until they are separately sent we cannot comment on the margins okay so great i think dipali point well made dipali was a little diplomatic saying it's difficult i think it's impossible when it's piecemeal uh, so yes, uh, the, the 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 margins are very very difficult to tell we'll move to the next case and here is a similar case with this kind of a lesion seen on endoscopy again surgery done and uh, removed and then you get this complete uh, excision tumor that says inverted papilloma with foci of malignant transformation so there are two three questions that i want to bring up here risk of malignant transformation and other tumors associated with inverted papilloma it's a real life situation you go and do these cases a lot of orl people use the micro debrider because it's a good tumor so i want some tips to give the youngster so that micro debrider you may not get tissue that you sent to dipali in the pathology room you might miss important uh, uh, information could diagnostic feature suggest a malignant transformation in imaging and i think gagan brought up this point a little bit 
and given the above hpr how would you manage would you give this patient uh, adjuvant radiotherapy so, so going case, back so... to the case of 51 year old male nasal obstruction epistaxis 3 months papillomatous lesion in the left nasal cavity occupying the middle meatus uh, extending towards the coana and the complete excision done again oral excision inverted papilloma on final histology with foci of malignant transformation back to my question take it in any order any of the surgeons first uh, uh. Uh, sir, in a inverted papilloma, medial maxillectomy is the standard treatment, and the lateral extent of the resection is in, in this inferior intraorbital foramen. And this uh, before the micro debrider came into being, so whole specimen should be sent for histopathology so that they can process the whole uh, specimen to look for any foci. Now with the advent of this micro debrider, we take biopsy and then uh, rest of the tumor is just. Uh, cut with the micro debrider and it goes into the suction so that is a disadvantage but you are at ease to uh, remove the tumor so uh, earlier the medial maxillectomy used to be done and the specimen should be sent as much as of it to the histopathologist so that they can make out if there is any malignant change in 10 to 12% of the cases there are changes uh, which lead to malignant uh, squamous cell carcinoma in this so i think ishwar has made an important point don't just send all the tissue into the suction bottle use your radiology look at the look generous biopsies of your tumor so that you don't miss a coexisting malignancy in your patients and the percentage of this coexisting malignancy varies according to the reported series is uh, any clues on uh, on imaging that can uh, tell you that you are dealing with a malignancy with the inverted papilloma so any but... extension of the tumor into the say orbit or this uh, uh, erosion of the bone that is in favor of uh, malignant malignancy absolutely and uh, would everybody give this patient now post operative uh, radiotherapy here is the post operative scan that you can see quite a neat job but for sign of malignant transformation and uh, any uh, would everybody give this patient a blinded uh, uh, radiotherapy post operatively uh, if if it would have not been done with a micro debrider and complete resection specimen has been would have been sent and there is a foci of uh, malignant transformation then i would uh, i will not be hesitant to give radiotherapy in this patient so But micro now, debrider micro debrider issue only came because there is a lack of biopsy specimen otherwise micro debrider is a good and great excellent tool I, for I for know. of these tumors we already have an histology and it's a foci of uh, of carcinoma in in a apparently well excised inverted papilloma so the, this is an inverted papilloma with a small foci of so mind it it's a good medial maxillectomy cavity you can well inspect the cavity at frequent intervals and uh, you also have a have your radiology to to back you up for any uh, recurrences in future so yes it can be debated both ways no but i think kapil i will put my money on you if it's just for sign of uh, malignancy i won't send all my patients to radiotherapy your point right. is very well taken it's a clean surgery a good median maxillectomy done i got the endoscope to look into the cavity i am not going to spend my radiotherapy on a hunch so i think it is important but quickly you do get malignant transformation uh, in inverted papillomas recurrences are high and that's why the micro debrider is very very essential to do but please take generous biopsies before you put that patient onto the table that's the point that we have to learn. we are not going to do away with the micro debrider it It is a very very useful tool in our armamentarium. Here is some some uh, data which the youngsters love. You know, the examiner asks you these kind of kufia questions. Low ADC scores on D1 I MRI uh, convoluted cribriform pattern, which Gagan referred to, does tell you that you may be getting malignant transformation. There are now papers saying that you can have what is known as collision tumors within uh, an inverted papilloma. I've put up the various collision tumors that you can have if the pali wants to comment on it. And when you give radiotherapy, here is the astro indications. 
gross invasion of the IP with SCC transformation. So microscopic foresight, don't send your patient into the radiotherapy room. Subtotal resection, inoperable diseases, and probably a debatable indication, benign IP with multiple recurrences. Of course, these are all retrospective series. You have to have more data. But I think Kapil's point is very, very important that don't push all your patient with microscopic foci, clean cavity, clean MR, observe your patient, repeated imaging, put your endoscope in, and I think you can save radiotherapy. Comments from any of the panelists, from any of our learned faculty who are not panelists before we move on to the next case. Regarding the surgery, like uh, to use a micro debrider or not, uh, we can use even micro debrider for such surgeries, but only thing is we should uh, send the base of the lesion separately uh, for uh, uh, any lesion, so even if yeah, you for margin, the, uh, yeah, for, for margins, margin. yeah, yes. very uh, important point, Vipin. I totally agree with you. Whenever you do these kind of endoscopic resections, uh, send uh, from the residual cavity suspicious areas to your to your uh, pathologist for margins. I think your point is very very important and well taken. So in this case, the patient should be told to about this and he should be told to be in regular follow-up so that he comes regularly after three Correct. months, whatever it is. So he should Absolutely. be aware of the fact that he has a uh, malignant change in his tumor. Absolutely. Okay, point taken. Anybody else? Non yeah, Dr. Dr. Anil, this is Dr. Pasi. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my, my question is uh, back to case number one. Uh, I just want to know uh, whether the line of... Yeah. Uh, uh, management uh, by the original surgeon was wrong. In in that case, which was taken as entrocornal polyp, it can happen. And he did an excision biopsy and sent it for histopathology. Well, was there anything wrong in it, in his no, approach? Uh, you know, we were lucky that we. I'm going to answer this, but then I'm going to give, give it back to the experts, the panelists who are... He's not wrong, but the point we want to make is don't get gung-ho with your endoscope and go in and pull out any tumors and then they come as TX. It happens with laser in the vocal cord. It happens for smaller tumors when people do robot, when we don't know the margin. It happens in oral tongue. People in a small, in an ENT department in the minor OT just excising leukoplakia, it will come back as invasive with close margins. Now for us to go back second stage to operate is a problem. So you must do generous biopsies, but my esteemed panelists can add anything more. Saurav, Kapil, DK. Uh, sir, the basic, uh, the basic point that you've made here is that uh, each and every case which is requiring uh, any, any sort of intervention should be better be discussed in a multidisciplinary board. Full plan be made uh, before before executing it. A complete plan be made before executing yeah, but, it. But uh, Gagan point, well taken. But remember, you are in a fancy Max Vaishali. You are sitting with a tumor board. Many of us work in ENT departments where we are treating them as chronic uh, conditions. Yeah, I mean, we are not constituting a tumor board. Your point is absolutely. But that... So the so biopsy the should have placed the diagnosis. So biopsy should have Absolutely. been taken from a representative area, and that could have given the clue right in the beginning. So biopsy must have been superficial. Yeah. That led to this fallacy. Yeah. So I think the point we'll just repeat quickly: age, clinical findings, radiology, which the panelists have said must be, and don't simply remove it. So in a way, I would say, Dr. Pasi, that the, 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 the doctor was wrong in a 55-year-old to just remove it and give us a TX tumor. Should have biopsied and got a diagnosis and then done it as a malignancy. We'll go to case three, which is a 45-year-old oh, So I just person. had a small point, so if I could just interject. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so at times we find that many of these inverted uh, lesions, so they extend upwards towards the cribriform. And yeah. if imaging at any point of time does indicate a suspicion, then I think we should have a low threshold to use frozen section during surgery to confirm that our margins are negative all around, especially yeah. at the reform plate. Yeah. I think point well taken. And I, uh, Vipin made this point. 
point as well that take out gerous biopsy so even when you are doing an inverted papilloma you can use frozen section if you if you suspect it doesn't look classical inverted there may be malignant changes in this uh, dipali wants to chip in how confident are you in the pathology frozen room to tell harsh that is uh, uh, inverted papilloma has malignancy if i see definite dysplasia and invasion i can say that this is definitely transformation into malignancy if there oh. is there's and if i don't see characteristic signs of malignancy i would just tone it down and uh, do not say directly that this is malignant transformation so i need invasion and a definite degree of dysplasia good degree of dysplasia perfect okay point well taken case 3 a 45 year old man presents with right sided nasal obstruction and epistaxis since 3 to 4 months imaging shows a mass that you can very well see in marked by harsh with a nice yellow circle it's in the right nasal cavity minimally extending into the maxillary sinus there is some erosion of the anterior skull base in the region of the cribriform the eye looks good uh biopsy taken comes as a round blue cell tumor uh, dipali comments when you when these youngsters see these kind of reports uh with the report ihc needed for further characterization can you talk us through this kind of a pathology report not in a speciality center what should be done yes sir so he is a 45 year old male and we are seeing on biopsy a round cell tumor which i think is a malignant malignant small round cell tumor so the differential diagnosis ranges here from lymphomas to ewing sarcomas and to snuck sinonasal undifferentiated carcinomas among which nut carcinoma especially is um, although it's very rare but we can see nut carcinoma as a small round blue cell tumor which is a malignant small round of blue cell tumor so for all those which you have all already tabulated here we would like to do first of all ck pan cytokeratin to see whether it is a epithelial tumor or not so a, a particular lineage of the tumor epithelial we do pan cytokeratin for lymphomas we do lca or uh, lymph leuco uh, leukocyte common antigen and for ewing spinet we want to do bimantin and uh, mic2 that is cd199 and for nut carcinoma if they are epithelial tumors okay then we will go ahead with the differential diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma nut carcinoma is a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma we would like to do p40 that's a squamous cell uh, uh, lineage marker if it is positive and then we would do nut if it is positive then the case would belong to nut carcinoma if lca comes positive that is leukocyte common antigen then we would think that this is lymphoma and then we will further characterize uh, that those tumors into b cell type or t cell type or n type we will do a battery of markers uh, uh, to characterize lymphomas further and if they are sarcomas for example ewing sarcomas as i said they are ck negative they are lca negative but they are cd99 positive so we would like to do translocations like translocation 1122 and sometimes melanomas can also look like malignant small Uh, round cell tumors in those cases we would do hmv45 and melan a for melanocytic lineage i think you have uh double if it's only and esthesia neuroblastomas we would like to do neuroendocrine markers low grade esthesia neuroblastomas are keratin negative and they are positive for synaptophysin and uh, chromogranin they, those are neuroendocrine markers they are positive for those markers and then uh, sinonasal neuroendocrine carcinomas sh are very very rare and now we know that this particular category of tumors they have uh, uh they have a deficiency or deletion of uh, sui snf chromatin remodeling complex genes like smarka4 so the tumors which we were saying that these are sinonasal neuroendocrine carcinomas uh, we don't know whether they would definitely be neuroendocrine carcinomas or they are uh, smarka4 deleted uh, sinonasal carcinomas and now we have ibh2 mutated carcinomas those are also you know look like neuroendocrine in morphology and they have neuroendocrine marker expression so that is further you know so i think the uh, section of uh, those tumors uh, sure. uh, the body, I, there seems to be an echo coming uh, Uh, so dipali you made very uh, good points but the point that i would like the youngsters to know 
is that whenever you yeah. get around a cell tumor uh, there are tumors that may not need surgery like a lymphoma they yeah. are they are tumors particularly for us treating head and neck of neuro no endocrine differentiation which are treated differently you have the esthesio you have the synonasal neuroendocrine carcinomas which has a small cell carcinoma which may not be treated by upfront surgery and you have snuck which is synonasal undifferentiated carcinoma so please do not rush in to operate your patient when you see round cell in the report you must characterize your uh, cases and then decide on the optimum approach a malignant melanoma will be treated totally different then i would treat an esthesio neuroblastoma so please do not rush in when you see uh, round take the slide send it to a speciality center the pali has told you so many markers that are being done we are not going to spend our time on those markers but the point is well taken that there is a very very uh, wide differential diagnosis but for us as surgeons we need to know those with neuroendocrine differentiation now if you see a patient with neuroendocrine differentiation back to the clinicians what what is the best method of treatment and i want sham to chip in here uh, what would his role for neo adjuvant be so first to the surgeons what would be the best method of treatment and then we'll go to sham on the role of neo adjuvant surgeons Sir, for the for the new endocrine carcinoma, I usually what we do nowadays is the sandwich therapy. We do the new adjuvant chemotherapy and then surgery and then a chemotherapy again. Uh, uh, also, uh, no. So, uh, sort of just to make it very clear, I. i have i have put back all the differential diagnosis of the neuroendocrine differentiations focus on one bullet one bullet two bullet three so, would you give neo adjuvant in so all sir, would you operate yes. some what would you do yes so well differentiated if it is a uh, i can get a, a clear margin i will operate first but okay. uh, for poorly differentiated i will not operate this uh, one which is a small cell or large cell moderately differentiated definitely uh, we can do it you uh, tumor board it can be debatable but uh, i i would like to do in the sino nasal malignancy definitely the new adjuvant chemotherapy and then okay i think points well taken i again for the interest of time uh, summarized there is a role of neo adjuvant chemotherapy for esthesio for snick and for snuck and i've put it up here i'd like sham to talk us through this yeah uh, uh the role the evolving role of uh, neo adjuvant in in neuroendocrine differentiated carcinomas the indications i've highlighted here right so so the, you already uh, put the slide here for esthesio neuroblastoma as you see if the tumor can be operated and radiation can be given well then maybe you know a uh, role of uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy may be limited but if the surgeon finds uh, that he or she is unable to remove the tumor in toto well then surely you know the new adjuvant chemotherapy will be effective because the response rates in esthesio uh, neuroblastoma with a cis platinum etoposide uh, protocol is like to the tune of 80 90% so i think you need to have a multi modality uh, you know approach here discussing with the surgeon now coming to the uh, neuroendocrine tumor per se so you know you need to do the ki67 which tells you the degree of differentiation and the you know the speed at which the tumor is going to progress so you know if if the differentiation or ki67 is less than 5% so these are not tumors you know which are amenable to uh, chemotherapy so if your ki67 is more than 30% so that indicates and it's a small cell tumor Uh, then i think the role of chemotherapy will be there in the new adjuvant setting uh, as regards the uh, snuck um, you know uh, it's it's a large cell tumor so i like to perhaps go chemo radiation rather than you know chemo alone uh, for a for a tumor which is a large cell tumor so that i think will sum up and maybe open the debate for for the further discussion okay so uh, uh, sham 
points well made just in the interest of time some of the indications are given everybody should know that there is some role for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in patients who have a neuroendocrine differentiated tumor if the tumor is operable in esthesio and in snick that's uh, synonasal uh, uh, not the snuck uh, uh, undifferentiated carcinomas uh, we will operate the patient up front but if it's a poorly differentiated tumor in snick and it's a snuck or a small cell tumor those patients today we are tending to go towards neoadjuvant and then take a call on the next step of treatment so you must note do please don't operate uh, when you have very aggressive tumors now at least me i don't use the ki67 marker to decide it's basically the volume of tumor and basically the biological aggressiveness of the tumor that will decide whether i want to go the new adjuvant route operate the or operate the patient up front comments from other panelists who are listening or even from the other faculty who are part of the discussion sir so, so my question is for moderately differentiating you and of thank you so a moderately differentiated i'll stick my neck out if it's operable immensely i'll go ahead and operate if anybody wants to contest it please put your points forward but if it's doubtful margins i'll go ahead and give new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy harsh akshat the youngsters if you all want to uh, so sir to summarize say anything sir. to summarize your slide uh, if it's a neuroendocrine carcinoma irrespective of histology if it's operable and small tumor surgery remains the mainstay of treatment if it is uh, locally aggressive as you very rightly said the tumor is beyond the confines of uh, your uh, uh, normal surgical uh, confines like the skull base and the orbit then new adjuvant chemotherapy has the role in all types of uh, uh, histologies if i may say uh, so, okay so i like to have a yeah. from dr dipali you know the the biology of the disease is uh, you know determined by the uh, the pleomorphism the mitotic index and even the ki67 so you know dr dipali can you comment on this <clears throat> yes sir so in synonasal tract by and large theoretically it is okay to say well differentiated moderately differentiated and poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas but in synonasal tract we hardly we hardly see carcinoids you know like well differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas where mitotic rate is less than 2 per 10 hypopil which we use in lung and other sites so well and moderately differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas by and large we don't see very rare and wherever we see neuroendocrine carcinomas they are either large cell type of neuroendocrine carcinomas or small cell uh, carcinomas where ki67 index is usually more than 50% or so i so just wanted to add one thing uh, regarding the new adjuvant only uh, as already uh, mentioned in the talk uh, for the organ preservation especially the orbit we should uh, consider new adjuvant if yeah. we have uh, you know uh, we will we will come to orbit in the next case uh, vipin we'll just keep the orbit out in the interest of time but your point is well taken we will come to uh, 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 the orbit in a, in a while here is the md anderson but anyway Sha uh, sham highlighted that it's cisplat etoposide that we give here is small series when i was at tartar's work that we did uh, with these uh, uh, neo adjuvant in uh, esthesio synonasal tumor with neuroendocrine differentiation but here is the md anderson protocol which is done for snuck so you do an endoscopic diagnosis induction chemotherapy you have a good response period patients go for definitive chemo radiotherapy stable disease if it's query resectable yes surgical resection post op chemo rads unresectable progressive disease just chemo rads uh, we'll go to the uh, fourth slide and probably we are past half hour uh, over time and then maybe we can wind up after this slide uh, i've taken this case from what is called slide sunne to kaam the patient uh jagjit uh, jagjit if you can please mute yourself jagjit bhatia can you please mute yourself okay so i've taken this, i've taken this series from the red journal it's in what is called gray zone cases and i just thought this is a very very good case because it opens up 
not only how we treat all sinonasal malignancies but also the newer vistas of treatment so here is a 53 year old man and the reference is given down for those of you all who want to read it it's a very interesting commentary after this a 53 year old man with a maxillary sinus mass alcoholism hypertension seizures lifelong smoking there's no vision change is very very important but he has sensation of periorbital pressure and intermittent nose bleeds CT scan shows a mass centered in the left inferior orbital wall. You can see both the axial and the coronal sections with complete opacification of the max left maxillary sinus and destruction of the left inferior orbital wall with extension into the soft tissue of the orbit inseparable from the inferior rectus muscle. Biopsy is a moderately differentiated SCC P16 negative. The patient insists that he valued preservation of vision above all else. I've quickly put up the MRI findings on the right so we don't waste time reading the scans. It's an enhancing 2.3 into 1.1 into 3.1 centimeter tumor obstructing the frontal and maxillary sinuses, not extending to optic foramina orbital apex, but involving the extraconal fat along the inferior rectus muscle. So this is in brief is the case history. And Richa, thank you for helping me to put it all into one slide. What will you do for this patient? Surgery with orbital eccentration, NACT response assessment, then radiation, chemo radiation or surgery, Pre-operative radiation treatment, sterilized margins operate, saving the or intra-arterial. I've only put intra-arterial for the youngsters. We won't debate on this because it is there in the literature, but none of us do it and only few centers do it, but just for completion for youngsters going for the exams. So we are going to focus on the top three. Surgery with orbital eccentration, NACT response assessment, radiation or chemo radiation, or preoperative radiation and then operate. Surgeons first. Sir, surgery. Uh, in Patient wants his eye saved. So saved eye uh, is is uh, is a sort of complex issue in this scenario. A saved vision might not be a best quality of life scenario in, in uh, post-treatment uh, cases. A saved but painful eye is also at times as bad as a uh, as a exenterated eye. But things apart, I think the patient wants his vision intact. So uh, mind it, as you had mentioned in the radiology, that uh, orbital apex and uh, uh, the posterior extraconal space is free of, uh, free of disease. And uh, the disease is only abutting the inferior rectus muscle. I would feel that uh, uh, considering the patient uh, characteristics, the new adjuvant chemotherapy, our ultimate aim should be the surgical excision. So new adjuvant chemotherapy and followed by uh, wide excision of tumor with, uh, with the excision of uh, inferior rectus muscle followed by radiation can give him best chance for uh, organ preservation. In this. But listen, if you excise the inferior rectus, is it worth keeping the eye there? Uh, as I said, it might be a uh, uh, sort of functionally uh, viable eye, but uh, uh, might have uh, issues with the diplopia and a bit of uh, uh, cosmetic discomfort. Okay, we we so, will come we'll come we'll come to that. Uh, others would any of your patient insist ki mera ang bachao, mera ang bachao. So sir, one uh, thing what, more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Go while, while the while the post-operative or pre-operative radiation decision is being taken, I would also like the radiation oncologist to clarify what are the chances of uh, of vision preservation with the radical radiation in such type of uh, cases also. Yes. Yes. Uh, may I? Uh, so, uh, sir, in this type of a situation, the problem with radiation also is the fact that uh, I will be ha I will be treating almost half the orbit. So, so the amount of uh, retina and conjunctiva that I will ultimately radiate, and and uh, the uh, uh, and and the iris and all those muscles, it will not really be a very uh, comfortable outcome. Uh, Gagan, may, maybe if you want to tell, I don't know if the other radiation oncologists listen. 
say, listening, would you like to share anything on the dose tolerance of the lacrimal apparatus and the orbit? Uh, what would be critical for the optic nerve, optic chiasm, uh, both in the definitive and in the pre-op setting? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, um, uh, sir, these are two separate scenarios. I will first talk about the scenario at hand. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, in an adjuvant setting, say you have done your uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and you have, you know, some, you know, as it comes to us, uh, radiation oncologists, the surgeons say that we have saved the eye, now it's the, the ball is in your court. But when, the, when, the, uh, when I have to give radiation therapy, I will have to treat the orbit, I will have to treat a huge part of the orbit because this is squamous, this is squamous cell carcinoma which has infiltrated into another structure. So I will have to treat that. Now to answer your question, uh, 60 gray is uh, uh, is is uh, highly intolerable for the retina. Anything above 40 gray has a has a high possibility of damaging the retina. Uh, the conjunctiva starts getting damaged above 35 gray, and uh, uh, and the dose required for an adjuvant treatment for in in such a in such a case will be 60 to 64 gray. This margin is positive, so probably a good a good idea would be to boost it. Uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But 60 to 64 gray and radical would be 70 gray. So in all these scenarios, the eye is not going to be uh, very uh, uh, you know very uh, very functional and a very uh, comfortable eye uh, with probably a painful red eye or maybe a, an eye with lot of retinitis with loss of field with, with field vision. Combine that with inferior rectus loss. I don't know how much he will be able to really have a stereoscopic vision. That's these are my first thoughts, sir. Uh, may I? Yeah. Saurabh, Saurabh. Bolo Saurabh. So, sir, I will go with the new adjuvant route. The only problem with the new adjuvant route is if, if the tumor will not reduce where we want it at the inferior rectus part. Uh, I will counsel the patient that we are giving the chemotherapy, new adjuvant to the patient, in the premise that it will decrease the size of the tumor. Uh, have a response in the intra, uh, intraorbital region, and then we can save the eye and give post-op chemo to the patient. If it will not decrease the size, uh, decrease in the uh, area of the uh, inferior rectus muscle, then it will be an intraoperative decision. Because sometimes uh, the MRI will be very misleading, or there will be very good play with the inferior rectus muscle during operation. Even you can do frozen section if it is very small part is. Uh, you know, involving the part, very small part is adherent to the inferior rectus, still you can save the eye. Definitely there will be radiation side effect. Uh, but if the patient insists, I, I will go with this, this route, with the counseling. I think, uh, sort of very important point that you have made that if when you are operating, decision to remove the eye should be made on table with frozen. Uh, no imaging is 100% uh, uh, sure that the eye is involved. So your point is very well taken. Don't, so a point again for the youngsters and operating surgeons, don't go in immediately and operate and remove the eye. Try to develop a plane, you can send the periorbita for frozen section and I think that even uh, parts of the orbital fat and then take your decision on removing of the eye. So uh, you may sometimes just get a plane even though the MRI says this. DK, Vipin, any, any suggestions from y'all on how y'all would like to treat? Certainly, sir. Yeah, ah, certainly, sir. I, I would echo your uh, uh, view, sir. Uh, MRI is not 100% sensitive in uh, uh, in deciding whether you are going to exenterate, but certainly I would counsel this patient that we might have to do exenteration even though it is a functional eye. So, so I will take a consent of exenteration in this patient, but certainly I would uh, make an intraoperative decision. Once the disease, once the disease is beyond the periorbita, you can take a periorbital fat and send it for intraoperative frozen section and make a final decision. But uh, as far as the patient is concerned, the patient will be counselled for uh, uh, orbital exenteration, and he has to consent for the uh, exenteration only then we'll proceed. Sir, it's a very important point. Uh, it is a textbook. Yeah. Uh, textbook reading that if the periorbita is involved, you then the eye has to be exenterated. That is not now uh, applicable. Even if the periorbita is involved, you can take out the fat, frozen section. If it is not involved, you can still preserve the eye. So for yeah. the students, it's very important. Consent. 
yes but always take a consent yes always take a consent but it is very important that peri orbita part if it is involved even then still you can save the eye so yes, ag again uh, points bipin and saurav are making Uh, sir, is very important. Only when I put the sir, Ishwar here. Yeah, bolo Ishwar. Sir, uh, this uh, has to be made as the other said intraoperative eyeball is to be removed when it the globe or the ball is involved. The fat will give a good plane, and nowadays, as literature says, uh, fat can be removed, and unless the uh, muscle or the eyeball is involved, only then go for the orbital excitation. You can Absolutely. get a plane intraoperative. So the muscle is involved, no? Here. Yeah. yeah. So it is on the MRI Gagan, only, yeah. Dr. Jodhan. But Gagan, the point that they are making, yeah, Gagan, the point that we are trying to make is that don't only base your findings and say it's sacrosanct on on imaging. I think the point that Vipin, Ishwar, and uh, Saurav are very making very strongly. is that we will make a decision to remove the eyeball on the table after frozen section and we'll always have consent of this before going to the operating rooms and i would totally agree with the three of them i would also operate the patient exactly the same if so we could save we will save we will save yeah so there is a cl classification from grade grade 1 grade 2 and grade 3 from lambda yeah. that if it is only the yeah. uh, peri orbita yeah. is not involved then it is grade 1 if the peri orbita involved it is grade 2 and if the rectus muscle is involved then it is grade 3 yeah the globe so in the, the grade globe. 3 when the orbital content or muscle yes yeah yeah that's the globe intraconal extension enetis classification i have a slide on it coming up but very very uh, very uh, Uh, right sort of but the problem is grade 3 it's a, no, a non starter the problem is in grade 2 very often we yes. take consent patient says bachao ank we also don't like to operate and remove the eye because a lot of these tumors are fairly advanced and sometimes this is another tip i'm giving you all if you have cleared the tumor from all other sides very very well you're very comfortable with the margin then compromising the margin on the eye is compromising cure and as kapil said you will get a painful eye in that case my threshold of removing the eye will be slightly lower because i'm going for the patient for cure but if i'm compromising in the region of the itf i'm compromising on the palate my my margin sometimes we we have these messy surgeries in that case i'm not going to do a mutilating excentration and get the widest margin on the eye i don't know uh, so you have to take this case very very individually when you treat but quickly the current status for this patient is surgery with orbital excentration followed by a juvent rt ct rt this is the standard of care but given that the patient doesn't want a uh, treatment is evolving there's a nice phase 2 trial that's running it's called the ecog acrin phase 2 trial ea3163 looking at the role of neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery versus surgery plus post operative radiotherapy on this line surgery is come twice it should read as neoadjuvant plus surgery followed by post op rt versus surgery and post op rt in the very case that we are discussing hopefully this uh, uh, results will guide us on to the role of neoadjuvant pre operative radiotherapy is being considered and there are lot of publications in the old literature but it's something that the princess margaret group of uh, brian sullivan and others are picking up again giving pre operative radiation to the tune of 5500 rads to sterilize the margin now generally optic tolerance is better up to 5500 if you give post operative radiotherapy you go to 60 to 66 if you give definitive 70 and as couple said you'll screw up the eye it will be a painful eye plus giving radiotherapy pre operatively there's very little anatomical perturbation there's not much disturbance in the anatomy so this is another approach that people are doing and the last of course is the intra arterial chemotherapy of homa from japan and kt robins and others 
but these two treatments nsct and pre op radiation are generally done in protocol setting if you are standard of care it should be surgery with orbital excentration and the point made by all the panelists deciding whether the eye should come out at the frozen section room or on the operating table open to comments from people sham can chip in with his uh, neo adjuvant chemotherapy so also gagan if you want to make any points right so i think uh, we have to understand the limitations of uh, neo adjuvant chemotherapy because it offers a response only in about 40 50% of the cases so there are going to be 20% cases or 30% cases who are going to have progressive disease so it has to be documented beforehand if you have a potentially curable disease with surgery and radiation so i'm going to go for that so in the absence of a laid down protocol i'm going to document very carefully that this patient is refusing surgery which includes excentration and he's opting for uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and the potential risks associated with the chemotherapy so gagan you want to sir make uh, yes, any sir. points yes sir uh sir the, uh the the point that comes to my mind is that assuming that we are successful in uh you know establishing that the so called type 3 uh, uh, intraorbital extension that the, the one where you can get away with the excision of fat and you get a negative margin uh, even then i would have to give a, a, a good amount of radiation dose and that would compromise on the uh, even if i'm able to save the optic nerve to some extent it, it would it would certainly compromise the Uh, the the dose to the retina and definitely to the conjunctiva and that would lead to a, uh, a not not such a not such a good eye maybe not a painful red eye but maybe uh, an eye which has got a, um, which won't be having a good a good stereoscopic vision maybe uh, more prone to retinal detachment and stuff like that uh, so uh, the, the 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 only point that i want to make is that the uh, that my surgical colleagues must understand that uh, at at the end of the day radiation will have its problems even though you have done a great job in uh, you know micro dissecting this particular case sir i i uh, have a question with dr gagan if may i dk any yeah go. so i want to ask one question sir, regarding I, the near adjuvant uh, uh, chemo like in this scenario suppose we give near adjuvant chemotherapy and there is a good response so and uh, now we decide to operate so what would be our margins and uh, especially the post op radiation margins also it is going to be same i think uh, what is your uh... Uh, anybody wants to make that are you asking me the question or are you asking the panelists so and any of the panelists or you sir i i am not sure about it sir So, sir so, it, it's the same uh, it's the same from it's the same premise when we give in the oral cavity it's a borderline or inoperable cases we give uh, nct and we compromise margin like if it is going up to valvular the tumor is in the tongue you compromise the margin there you have to and you are giving uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy to save the eye you will compromise the margin there definitely it's the same thing it's nothing uh, different here no but having said that there may be a slight difference in that the periobita is a very very strong barrier to the spread of cancer and when you go in and you operate if the periobita is not involved i am not going to take out the eye as in previous margins the premise of saving the eye is that you have shrunk the tumor you have a periobita if it's involved the fat is involved yes the eye will come out finely here is a meta analysis looking at various indications which ricardo caruz uh, meta analysis and absolutely no difference in outcomes when you remove the eye and don't remove so please the eye is a different structure dk you don't have to go in immediately and remove everybody's eye like i said in my slide the right treatment is surgery followed by radiotherapy but removing someone's eye in a disease that's anyway going to kill him uh, is is very very painful so don't have a very low threshold your threshold to save the eye should be high and here is the meta analysis that is showing of course if you have ents uh, what these boys are talking about type 3 like this this patient will 100% have uh, uh, the the uh, the eye removed so yes sir, uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, the answer I... is not out the accren study but probably tell us uh, when we want to uh, 
save the eye or operate the eye with neo adjuvant chemotherapy go ahead comments sir, sir i i read this people and they are not uh, sure that uh, their results is validated uh, completely uh, yeah. because they, they in the exaggeration uh, because of the disease is much more aggressive in those cases that's why the results are much uh, worse than the when they save the eye so uh, yes definitely they are they are comparable but still uh, debate is there sir. yeah and here is here is the reasons why they don't say that their studies are validated retrospective heterogeneity difference in uh, in protocol there's a lot that we can uh, debate on this on the i but i'm quickly going to end with this one slide for the youngsters can i ask a question dr de cruz uh, you see imola's paper though it's an old paper it's an old paper gives very good things on how the eye will function post operatively so if you do conservative procedures on the eye and you should refer to this paper it's fairly often cited overall eye function as reported functional without impairment in about half functional with impairment in 37% and non functional in in 9% the most common abnormality was globe malposition so when you operate remove a large part of the orbital flow i think shamit also alluded to this miss talk you must reconstruct the orbital flow very very properly give your give your radiation oncologist give your patient a well reconstructed eye with a lot of good soft tissue there if you put a skin graft into the maxillary cavity and then the eyeball sagging and you tell gagan to go radiate the patient is going to have a non functional painful eye and persistent diplopia is seen in 9% of patients and the problems of radiation again gagan has highlighted this uh, optic atrophy cataracts dryness and ectropion so do your reconstruction well and uh, then send your patient have a low threshold but really the right treatment is surgery and uh, and uh, exaggeration uh, there's a lot more that we can discuss and i've got another 10 cases but i think it's nearly going to yes. be nine and and we must call it a day so i'm going to hang back to saurav if there any uh, panelists that want to make any comments please go ahead and make your comments now and then so yeah dr de cruz i have a question saurav you can take over so, have... dr sham dr sham has a question Oh, so, listen! I don't know whether it, this is allowed in panels. The moderator asks the questions, not the panelists asking the moderator. But go ahead, Sham. I I enjoy when there's lot of interaction. Go ahead. This question is related to what the previous uh, panelist, you know, raised that question. So we uh, give cycles of new adjuvant chemotherapy, and the tumor is not seen in the eye anymore. So you go ahead and do the surgery for the sinus. and take a biopsy or you know do the i part and the biopsy is positive so what is the radiation protocol going to be then gagan sir 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 this is exactly the kind of dichotomy even if the margin comes out to be negative i mean the problem definitely is that that margin is compromised so i have to i have to be very careful and not compromising it with my radiation as well and which is where i come that Uh, at the end of the day uh, the, the the surgical uh, surgeons can save the eye but radiation some scatter and definitely it will go there so this is one part that's why i reiterated that uh, uh, we have to be prepared for that sort of a thing especially in a squamous cell carcinoma where uh, um, uh, where the entire uh, compartment actually gets contaminated uh, when when it's infiltrated So, so then will not the IMRT or proton save the uh, give the radiotherapy ML radiation and save the eye? Sir, certainly IMRT and proton will help. But the point is that when we are marking that area, that area is so close to the eye that some dose will definitely go to the eyeball, and definitely some dose will go to the nerve. And uh, uh, the I mean I mean. I, i mean right now the next statement i'm going to make is a little bit not may not be specific to this case because here i will have to see all the cross sectional anatomy but it is quite possible that the inferior orbital uh, the, the inferior rectus that is uh, that, that is infiltrated it's it's going to meet the optic uh, nerve back there so i will probably have to give some radiation to the optic nerve as well so imrt can save the surrounding structures when they are not a part of the problem 
uh, the far away structures. Like for example, lacrimal gland is not going to be a problem. Sir asked, Dr. Degru sir asked that, you know, lacrimal, will that be a problem? No, lacrimal is far away laterally. It's not going to be a problem anymore. It's not going to be hard, it's not, not even going to be affected by it. But the inferior part of the, uh, inferior part of the orbit, the, the nerve hair, and all these things will get irradiated and the dose will be sufficiently high. So the, so the, uh, uh, the, the retina inside is going to get damaged and, and those things. Maybe the, uh, the, the, the anterior, um, the, the AC, the, the, this, the iris part, these muscles may, may get some dose and maybe the, uh, the accommodation. So the eye will not be a very good eye. Diplopia and other things will be there. Maybe the ectropia and all will not be a problem anymore because we save the skin and uh, IMRT uh, scatters the dose all over so that uh, the skin is not getting that much dose. But there will be problems. So IMRT will give you better outcomes, but will not give you the best outcomes. Will not really save it, save it. So I think so, looking at the way Gagan is trying to explain you and what Sham and Ishwar asked, it is a very, very difficult decision. And if your eyeball margins are close or positive, radiating, even with those painting proton, you're going to screw up the eye. And that's why I shared the, the, the uh, Princess Margaret uh, method of going back to looking at pre-operative radiotherapy with 5,500 to sterilize the margin. And if you read literature, uh, George Sessions and others did bring out this concept of low dose radiotherapy and then going to save the eye. At those days, radiotherapy was very crude. They could not really sterilize the margin. Eye couldn't be saved. It's something that is work in progress. I don't know the answer. I'm repeating the right treatment is surgery followed by RT. There is no doubt about that. We have no doubt, but all of us I mean, Saurav, uh, Vipin, Ishwar, whoever, I can see all try to save Kapil. We try to save the eye. It's not so easy to remove someone's eye. It's not like removing one millimeter or two centimeters more from buccal mucosa. It's just not the same. It, has it, is, it, is, it is difficult than the larynx. Of course. Of course, it's so. And even the moment you put that clamp across the optic nerve for a disease where you know the patient may come back in a year, it's very traumatic for the surgeon. At least I feel it's one of the most brutal operations I do. But on, on the lighter side, patient will be ready to uh, ask for the surgery if you save the eye for that patient. But they will definitely go for radiation even if you radiate the eye. They are okay with that. Yeah, I yeah. Sir, uh, life is Ravi here, sir. Yeah, Ravi. Sir, uh, uh, actually, we are actually having this uh, live streaming on YouTube also. So there is one question by Dr. Gopal Kumar. Uh, huh. What is the criteria of free margin in paranasal sinus tumors? Uh, surgeons, please answer. So in uh, paranasal sinuses, you are not sure because they are bony case and uh, the margin may be positive uh, postoperatively. So it has to be a combined treatment. So I doubt that there is any uh, uh, criteria for margin. No, but Ishwar, so, while so, I agree, I uh, agree with you. There may not be a centimeter margin or a millimeter margin, but you will try to keep the the. You'll go the compartment above. And you will try to get negative from there. So if you are doing a maxilla, you will take out a little bit of the ethmoid mucosa and make sure that it is not involved. Exactly the same with the eye. Exactly the same with the infratemporal. So it won't be one centimeter, five millimeters, two millimeters. You will take out from suspicious areas and make sure that there is more so in aggressive histologies. So after the removal, I don't know do whether after the removal of the specimen, we do look for any suspicious. Absolutely, data. absolutely, absolutely. We should look for the tumor base as well, sir. Where it absolutely. is arising from, actually. Absolutely. So, to, to take so a I, margin from there. Yes. I totally agree with you there. I totally agree. Sometimes, if the bone doesn't look too good, we try to drill out and take out some shavings of the bone as well. You know, just to make a hundred percent sure that we are not leaving back gross disease and then we send to Gagan to do his dose painting. Yes, sir. 
Ravi, any other question? Okay, great. Ravi, this is, uh, it's nine o'clock. So, Ishwar, we, we beat the record of your previous webinar, which was three hours. We are, what, one minute short of three hours. By the time we say thank you, we'll be two minutes over. Definitely, definitely sir. Definitely, sir. Okay, there was a lot more to uh, discuss. Thank you. Thank every... you very much. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Saurabh. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It's always a nice feeling when we interact with you. Uh, and uh, maybe the many more sessions in the future. And uh, I thank you all the panelists, uh, Dr. Ishwar Singh and Dr. Sham Agrawal. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for giving us that time today. Uh, Dr. Gagan uh, from Meditation Oncology from Max, uh, Dr. Vipin Aroda and Dr. Kapil, Dr. Uh, DK, and uh, a special thank to Dr. Dipali uh, from Pathology Department from Ames. And now I uh, also I uh, want to thank uh, Harsh uh, for chipping and also uh, Akshat uh, during the session. And uh, now I hand over the uh, proceedings to Dr. Zavi uh, Meher uh, for uh, final comments. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just a comment. Yes, it was yes. a very well uh, conducted panel by Dr. D. Cruz, sir. A credit goes to you for uh, making it so lively and simple and uh, uh, involving everyone so the time is uh, taken by you sir because of your expertise so, and uh, standing and depth of knowledge that's why this panel has extended to a uh, uh, newer height or a uh, newer uh, record thank you sir for I, I, i'm going to respond i always feel a panel is good if you have good panelists so yeah. i always believe if the captain doesn't win the for the for the, the, the cricket match, all the players have to play and it's testimony to the panelists. When you all are aggressive, if everybody sits quietly, then it's not a good panel. When people come forward, then it's a very good panel. And thank you all for participation. And once again, thanks to Harsh and others who helped me put it together. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think it was a excellent uh, uh, panel discussion conducted by Dr. Anil D. Cruz. And we had uh, very interesting talks by Dr. Smithy, Dr. Shamit, and uh, Dr. Karan. And I would like to thank all the panelists from Delhi OI. And uh, I can see few senior uh, uh, Delhi OI members also joining the meeting. This uh, meeting will be available on YouTube also. The recording will be available on the same link which has been circulated to uh, all the delegates. So you can act, uh, watch it at your ease, at your own convenience. And uh, in the last, I thanks again all the panelists and the faculty members for making this uh, webinar a very successful one. Thanks a lot.